All right. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to another edition and installment of David Green Real Estate on a live stream here on YouTube Friday. Hope everyone is doing great. Uh, yeah, Vera, thanks for that. She says, love the free form format on this show. We are going to get very free tonight on this show and super excited to have everyone here. David will be with us in just a moment. We've got a special guest tonight. Courtney, is it Cousins? Is, did I say that right? I should have asked you. Yeah, no, that was good. Courtney Cousins, all the way from Ohio, is our special guest tonight because she is going to be asking questions of David. And these are not just your basic questions like, how do I house hack? Or how do I burr, David? How do I buy something with no money down? No, this is going to be more specific regarding the life of David Green. So you're going to get a little peek behind the curtains into David's life. But in the meantime, do us a favor. Tell us a little bit about where you guys are coming from tonight. Uh, we want to hear where you guys are at. I see Matthew here from Richmond, Virginia. He came in almost an hour before the live stream started to let us know where he's from. So I love it. Early birds get the worm. Tanya, our girl from the Spartan League, is here from Northwest Michigan. Welcome. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I love it. Another person watching live and in the air. Very cool. Thanks for watching us, John. Be careful. Hopefully you're not flying that plane. Uh, Kevin from Lakeland, Florida. What is going on? Great to have you here. Uh, yeah, Osazi, San Jose is in the house. Welcome. Uh, let's see, we've got a question here from John. He says, David, can you talk a little bit about your broadcast schedule? I notice it's not every Friday night. That is true. It's not. It's just about every Friday night. It's every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, with the exception if David's traveling or if somebody else uh, is traveling on the team and we just can't uh, get it together. So it's just about every Friday. Um, some Fridays we don't take, uh, we were not able to make it. But the best way to kind of know is go to David's Instagram at DavidGreen24, and there's more information there. Uh, Jason, man, I get to feel like I get to see you all the time. I've seen you again. He's a Spartan leaguer, was in our info session. He's coming to the David Green Retreat in Fort Lauderdale, July 26th through the 30th. So go check that out. Uh, Larie from San Pablo, what's up? Javier, Spartan leaguer, what's going on? Angela, Spartan leaguer, what's going on? I love the representation from the Spartan leaguers. Crystal from St. Louis, happy Friday night to you as well. Vera, Saying again, she loves the free form format. Chris from Lowell, Massachusetts. What's up, man? Another Spartan leaguer. Soch from North New Jersey. We got everybody representing us. Um, do us a favor, by the way. Uh, like and subscribe and share this video. We got about 37 people right now. I'd love to see this get up to uh, you know 100 people tonight because there's going to be some really good content, some really good stuff we're talking about tonight. So. Do us a favor. Also, we're almost up to 13,000 subscribers for this YouTube channel. I think we're like 100 away or something. So do us a favor and do that as well. Look at David playing with uh, the format. Always I'm messing really, things up. I'm screwing you up, Kyle, as you're talking, aren't I? David, you're like ultra Spartan league today. I love it. You got like a lot of helmets, right? Yeah, I see like the one in the corner and then on your shirt and then on the mic. Mine does, my camera doesn't pick it up, but I do have it right here. Uh, I look like I'm surrounded by Spartan Warriors. I feel very safe. Yes, you are. There's a lot of them here. Lisa's one of them. Priscilla, one of our retreat members. Priscilla's going to be joining us on a YouTube Live here soon, talking about her experience on the retreat and the action steps she's taken after. So hanging out all the way over in Scotts Valley, right outside of uh, Santa Cruz. It's like the cool part where you have all like the mountainous redwood trees and stuff like that. Super pretty. So good to see you, Priscilla. Uh, John Bear, Central Pennsylvania, Diana from LAX. What's going on, Divi? We know you. Uh, Zach from Missouri. Good to see you once again. Waiting to hear about the retreat. So next Friday, we're most likely going to have a specific discussion about the retreat. But if you want to go get information about it now, you can go to davidgreen24.com slash retreat. 
Um, and people are starting to reserve their spots now. So now is the time to go and check that out. Um, but we're going to do a whole in-depth conversation about it with some of our former retreat members next Friday. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, Dan from Dayton. What's up? So, hey, there you, do you know Dan, Courtney? I sure do. That's my boss. Oh, really? Okay. No pressure tonight. What's going on? I, I was just kind of teasing. I didn't think you would actually know somebody from Ohio, but it actually was your <laughs> boss. Well, welcome, Dan. Uh, don't put too much pressure. Jimmy, what's going on, my man? Good to see you. Michelle from California. Leo from Boston. Chantel from Charlotte. We got Seattle with Marnie. Avondale, Arizona. Michael and Haiti. David, you trimmed the beard. Did you trim it? Yeah, I'm surprised someone noticed. <laughs> we talked about that mm -hmm. so much. So I didn't trim the whole thing. But what I did was like the sides were kind of bugging me. Like at the bottom, it was sticking out, right? Mm -hmm. and it just I don't know. It looked like a beaver or something weird. So someone had the idea of trim the sides and leave the bottom, which I thought was actually I didn't think about that. Yeah. Right? I was just doing the whole thing. So I trimmed the sides where they were sticking out, but I kind of left like the bottom portion down more. How is it? Does it look Good. different? Does it look better? I'm surprised uh, you noticed it. I think it looks really clean cut. I think it looks good. But yeah, beard gate. People are like, follow. This is a trending topic on Twitter, I'm sure. I saw it last week and I, I think it looks cleaner now. Yeah, that's a very nice way of saying you should keep doing that, David, until it's all the way shaved I, down. I think it, I think that's your sweet spot right there. This is it. Yeah. I would. Well, see, the, here's the problem, Courtney. I'm hoping it could get bigger. I want it to be a little more dramatic, but clean. But it's in this awkward like puberty stage where it's not growing out of the awkwardness. But if I shave it to make it clean, I'm just going to go back into it. So the question was, how long do I let it stay ugly before it like grows to something normal? But I think so, the answer was to trim parts of it. Yeah. When you were saying that, it's just like a girl who like has bangs and then they want to go from bangs to no bangs. It's a hard transition. Bangs to no bangs. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah like walk us through like, that. I, this is something... I haven't cut my bangs in quite a few years, but um, yeah, you you either have bangs or you have them just falling in your face on the sides, and it looks really strange. So there's a there's an awkward stage for bit like, but you're not trying to grow mm -hmm. bangs to be huge. You're not uh, trying to have like a unicorn horn. Well, they go that. down, so it's like half your hair is like here in the front, and it just shelves over. Yeah, there's I, so much about women that men don't understand, and probably yeah, we're so person. confused. Kyle and I talk about this stuff, so it's like fascinating to us how different the two genders are. I know that's controversial to say, but still, like Priscilla and I had a conversation in the kitchen at the retreat about like how men are affected by women, and she was blown away. She was like, "There's no way that's what it's like for you guys with us." And then I went to every guy there, and they're like. <laughs> yeah, like obviously that's the case. And their jaws were dropping like, how could that be the case? And then when we hear about what life is like for you guys, we're like, what? That's what you go through every single day? Like, I had no idea. And so uh, if you guys haven't been introduced to this, I find it to be fascinating. I know right now the trend is to say that men and women are the same. But like, <laughs> in the end, nobody actually, no man wants to be treated like a woman and no woman wants to be treated like a man. It is much better to learn about the differences and how to make people happy than to uh, assume that like we're all the same. Courtney, I know this is a weird thing and you're going to be interviewing me, but I'm just curious. Have you done any research on intersexual dynamics, read books that are written about like the differences, communication style, stuff like that? So when we talked a couple weeks ago, you told me about Alison Armstrong. And I did okay. listen to a lot of uh, maybe three or four of her videos. I haven't read a ton of it, but when I, I studied psychology in uh, college and we did talk a little bit about like the neurological differences um and the actual structures in your brain that are different for men and women a lot of them are like in the communication centers of your brain i thought it was pretty interesting i wonder guys tell us in the chat would you be interested in a show about this stuff like everything that men wish that women knew about men and everything that women wished that men knew about them because um i've been like i know we're kind of going off topic here there's a lot of people getting divorced right now. I like just I, there's so many people okay. that have been in my DMs asking for advice not on how to save their marriage but like how to split up the assets. It's been constant and then people in my personal life, people in our business life, like divorce is is very hard to be married. I'm not married, 
but I just listen to it and I'm like, I can see both sides. I'm like, dude, that's, <laughs> that is scary. Courtney, I know you're married, so hopefully everything's going well on that front, but I'm sure you can admit like it's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking how no one prepares us for what it's like to get married. So if you want to buy a house, you, and you have a good agent, like we make you go through a buyer consultation. We send you information about it. We have a person that walks you through what to expect buying a house. You have a representative that helps. Then you get the house. You have podcasts to listen to. You have books. You can, there's so much information about just buying a house, which is nothing like being married to another person that's radically different than you in so many ways. And it doesn't get spoken about. So I'm just curious. It looks like people in general are liking that type of content. Like if I want to be married someday, which I do, it would behoove me to be preparing for that now. As opposed to, I bought a house and then let me figure out what to do. Do you feel like there's certain things, Courtney, when you got married that you were like, man, no one told me it was going to be like this? Oh, I was like super young. <laughs> so I think I was growing up at the same time. But even now, like we've been married for almost seven years. And uh, we there. I think that there's always going to be seasons that you're learning to work together better. I don't know. Maybe somebody who's been married for more than seven years can tell me. So you're saying it's going pretty good so far. Like there hasn't been any shocking. Um, it's going, yeah, I have a good marriage, but I, it's interesting growing up and learning to work together. But I, I just feel like each new season of life, it's another chance to learn Yeah. how you're going to mesh and how you're going to evolve together. And I don't know if that ever goes away. But that's, I think that's a great perspective that every season is a chance to learn versus someone who shows up to marriage saying, this is who I am, you have to make me happy. That's probably clashing conflict all the time, difficulty, right? Like just that fact alone, go into marriage at, with marrying a person that you are fascinated about learning about them and yeah. be looking forward to it. Because if you're not that way, it probably goes bad, right? I think that advice alone could be helpful to people that are not married to understand, especially, you know, you said you got married young, so you were probably a little more pliable like, I don't know oh, everything yeah. about the world. Let me figure out yeah. how this works. And, but like me, I'm 40 for me to get married. I'm a little more set in my way. So it would behoove me. I would think it would make sense to be preparing for what I'm going to have to learn about adapting and change. And I think I talked to Kyle about it all the time. The poor guy has to, he's like my marriage counselor and I'm not married. <laughs> no, I like this. And we're getting a lot of really good feedback. I'm curious though, too, if you think this is a bad idea for like a show or something, right? Type that in the comments too, because the way we kind of worded it was like, if you think it's a good idea, yeah. give us feedback. Curious if you think it's a bad idea, but this it really is how David and I uh, sort of control our, our or run our entire lives is about these things. We've been having conversations about this for for twenty years. So if you think it's a bad idea, let us know too. But um, yeah, marriage and relationships in general are extremely, extremely hard, and and you can go so deep, and it's so nuanced, right? And just the differences between men and women uh, in general, but then also being married to someone living in the same house uh, and then also having like independent goals and, and um, values and, and what comes down to each other's core values. So yeah, let us know if you guys think it's a bad idea, but from right now, it sounds like everybody thinks it's a good idea. Oh man, look at this Aaron, man. 23 years he's been married with 10 children. Ooh. Bro, what is the secret? Tell us. Like, type it in the comments, man. Good for you guys. That's really, really cool stuff. Um, okay, should we segue into today's topic? We might even talk, bring some of this stuff out a little bit in terms of uh, the behind the scenes of, of what David's life looks like. But let me tell you a little bit about what today's show is going to be about. So um, if you came here to learn how to burr today or learn how to buy something with zero money down, this is probably not the show to watch. But that doesn't mean that you should stop watching because what we're going to be doing today is we're actually going to be diving into David's psyche a little bit. We're going to be diving into a little bit of behind the scenes of how his life works, what motivates him, what drives him, how he thinks when it comes to business, when it comes to uh, relationships and hiring and firing and building a business and what actually drives him to do the things that he does. Um, and the way this kind of all transpired is basically Courtney here um, reached out to David and said, hey, I've heard your story, but I've never really heard the why behind the story, right? Well, why do you do some of the things that you do? And so David thought it would be a great opportunity, and Courtney agreed to say, hey, come in and let's make this be a no-holds-barred type of conversation where Courtney's going to come in. She's going to come in with some punches. She's going to get David back on his heels a little bit. And um, no, really just get some behind the scenes of, of what makes David 
tick. So, um, Courtney, would you mind just sharing with a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from? I know your boss is watching what you do for work and, um, and what you're excited about for tonight's conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I am from Ohio. I live in a little country town in between Cincinnati and Columbus here. It's a, we have a fixer upper big old house on five acres that is about 80% done. We've been here for about six years. Um, I've got a two year old son named Leo. He is just everything to us. And, um, we got two older dogs and, um, I, I, I told you a minute ago, I was previously in childcare and I have a passion for children and education, but I also, um, really love real estate. And so after I had my son, um, and I decided I was just taking too much time away from him at work. Um, I found my boss, Dan, and uh, he was looking for somebody to work in his real estate company. And I was so excited. I didn't have to have an, uh, um, like a license and I was able to work from home. So I thought I was going to get into something that I was super interested in and passionate about. And I didn't realize like how much I was going to really learn. And, um, and I've been able to, we, my husband and I got our first investment property in October it's an Airbnb down in Cincinnati nice. and it's been going really well and looking to scale a little bit. Um, and, and yeah, that's pretty much. Oh. I love it. Very cool. Well, we are excited. So the format for tonight's discussion is going to be this Courtney is going to be in the interview seat. Usually David's the person who does the interviews. David actually gets to be the guest. He's the person being interviewed. Um, David Courtney gave me a, her list of questions. She's got some amazing questions on there. One thing I got to say to you, David, is try to keep them a little bit shorter. And if, if we like it, we'll go deeper into it because she's got a lot of good questions. I want to make sure we have time to get to the good ones, which come at the end. No pressure, Court. Also, I can be very long winded since I'm um, usually the one asking the questions. When I finally get to talk, I like the fire hose erupts. Well, I've, I've kind of uh, taken out some of the fluff. And so I think that we'll just get into the the ones that we really want to know where we won't hear somewhere else. So only question I have for you right now, you sound like you have a bit of a Southern accent, but you're in Ohio. In California, we are a little bit like Kyle, am I crazy? Or are you hearing something? Yeah. Is it an Ohio accent? That is it like a version of a Southern accent? Um, I think that you would be the expert on that. I live here. So I think mm. I sound. <laughs> I do have. So do I have an accent to you? Mm, man, I listen to you so much. I don't think I'd pick up on it anymore. We need but Fred Armisen here. We need what? Fred Armisen. He's like the, he can do every dialect in the world. Oh, like Frank Caliendo type mm -hmm. of a thing. So yeah. Courtney, you can have me answer any of your questions in an accent of your choice, by the way, should okay. you so choose. I was Thank just, uh, <laughs> I was curious if like Ohio is considered the South because I think of it as the Midwest. So I don't think of it as having that Southern accent. I mean, I, I do, I don't, I can't see my neighbors. So, um, I do live kind of in the middle of nowhere. I, I was raised in a little town, but I yep. guess compared to California. Yeah. I think it's like it listening to a country song when you talk, that's the best way I describe it. A small town, <laughs> upper, got married young, my child's yeah. living my life. Right. Like mm. it's definitely like you're the personification of a very sweet country song. Everyone else is saying the accent is Midwestern which I may not understand the difference. When I think of Midwestern, I think of like Wisconsin. So Minnesota. that could be my, my error. Yeah, Minnesota. She has no idea what to say that. Sorry, Court, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with it. It's very pleasant. I've never been told that I have an accent. I'm interested. Yeah, this happens a lot. Like I always ask people if we have accents in California and I'm told, no, you actually have no accent. Like you're, you're the lack of an accent uh, where we are. But then I wondered if everyone thinks that or if, if you would think I have an accent because I don't have as quiet of a sweet drawl as you have. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> that might be a little exaggeration, but yeah, it's close. <laughs> That's very hard to do an accent without going too far. Like I, I can't do a light Russian accent. accent. What's that? I think you should talk in that accent. I could. You you tell me which one you want, whatever it is. We've done shows before where people just commented largely about the accents for the whole time. <laughs> All well, right, Courtney, we'll let you off. we'll let you take it away. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, so I've been listening to your guys' show for just a little bit. I um, I, I kind of just found it. 
Um, but I don't know how you guys met. So why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Kyle, you want to start? Well, sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> David and I met uh, in two in the year 2000, literally. So Sounds we're like looking at science fiction. In the year 2000. <laughs> yeah. So like 23 years ago, uh, we met. We were uh, seniors in high school and we were at rival high schools in a small town called Manteca, California. And uh, we basically took a class that was called ROP. It was like an occupational class where all the high schools could go to to take that class. And uh, we both found quickly that we had a connection over basketball and um, kind of just and God dumb, and God for yeah. sure. And uh, dumb, silly, dry dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> were they called dad jokes back then? I don't think they were. No, no they were just called corny. Yeah, nerd <laughs> jokes. Yeah. David, you want to add to that? No, it's like you said, uh, we we got extra credit if we agreed to go paint the little like building that we were in. So we both showed up to paint and didn't spend very much time painting. We mostly just goofed around and we had a mutual friend. I guess that's the other thing. Matt Hine was like, mm -hmm. I grew up going to church with them and Kyle knew him because they played basketball together at the different high school. So that was kind of like the connection. And Kyle, just a guy that you meet right away and you're like, that's a trustworthy guy. Like he's not perfect. No one's perfect, but it is very easy to see that he's genuine and most people are not that way. A lot of human beings, you got to spend a significant period of time trying to figure out what's their angle. What do they want? Like, right. am I going to make that person happy or why do they want to be my friend with Kyle? It was kind of what you see, what you get. And we started, we just got hit it off really well. We played basketball for like one of our first hangouts and I, my nails were too long and I cut him and he forgave me for it. So our relationship sure. started off based on grace. Aww. So, has it been, have you guys been close ever since or like 23 years is a long time? Has it, did you drift apart and come back or have you? That is a good before? point. So I stayed basically where we lived and he moved, he moved to a lot of places. He moved to Iowa to play basketball. Then he moved to Redding to play basketball. Then he moved to Southern California to coach basketball. Redding's like super Northern California. Okay. And he got married and he started having kids. And I was like, nope, I just graduated college and became a cop. But that's He had a very exciting life and mine was very just like kind of straightforward. But we were intentional about staying friends. I think that is the difference with why we are friends today. And maybe what makes like relationships in general work is we I didn't just let it happen. And Kyle didn't just let it like when he moved we made efforts to talk on the phone about what we had going on, what struggles we were having, what was causing depression, anxiety, fear, excitement. Like that it was definitely not shallow conversations that we were having. So if we went nine months without talking and maybe we just sent emails or something because texting wasn't a thing, believe it or not. Like it's hard to imagine communicating without text message, but that wasn't the case. It, we sort of picked up where we left off. Whereas some friends, if you're not intentional, it, they're just a relationship of convenience. You just happen to like the same stuff and be in the same places. Yeah. And I'll add to that really quick. <clears throat> um, what happened was my freshman year of college, when I went to Iowa to uh, play basketball, David and I had, were kind of like sort of drifting apart. Cause yeah, back then, unless you were really intentional, there was no social media. There was no, um, really nothing to keep in touch other than email or talking on the phone verbally and guys just don't verbally talk on the phone. So I remember David sending me a long email saying, Hey man, like I want to redefine the relationship here. I want to redefine like, what are we doing? Are we did just friends to be friends? Did, I, What's that did I say it like that? Yeah. It was like a DTR kind of thing, right? <laughs> Tell everyone what a DTR is. This is something they learn at Christian schools or Kyle. Yes. Yeah, so for those of you that don't know, a DTR is basically when a girl and a guy who have been kind of talking to each other at a Christian at a Christian college or something, they get together to have a DTR, which stands for determine the relationship, which is basically like, hey, are we boyfriend and girlfriend or not? Are we going to be serious about this or not? Because if we're not, we're going to we're wasting our time and let's move on to something else. Kind of like a board meeting. So um, David sent me a DTR email and was like, I want to like redefine our relationship here. Like, are we going to be serious about it? Or are we just going to be buddies that play video games all the day and all the time? And so I thought it was kind of weird at first. It was kind of off putting. But then I took some time to like think about it. And I was like, you know what? He has actually has a good point here. And so I, uh, I responded with my, my DTR. You've presented that. In a very romantic light. I, in my mind, it did not feel as romantic as you're making that sound. It was intentional, it sounds like. Yeah, it was intentional. Kyle's definitely like shined a bit of a, 
of romantic a yes on that um i'm glad that Chantel says it's cute i was a little worried none of the guys here are saying that's cute they're like what now i want to know more about this thing like well i think it's something i actually think it's something that that guys should be comfortable with to be honest right it's be comfortable in terms of being vulnerable and like you talk about these relationship dynamics it's like i think there's a big uh push against men like you can't actually like be intentional about relationships and friendships and stuff like that and it's important so uh yeah i love it mikhail says shit or get off the pot lol <laughs> and it is romantic just in a <laughs> non-romantic way <laughs> It's a good question, Courtney. You're asking very my here's what my thoughts were. I graduated high school. I had a ton of buddies. Like guys have buddies, right? We don't have like BFFs. We right. played basketball together, had class together, played baseball together, grew up together, had sat near each other at lunch. And then a couple years after high school, y'all go to different colleges. I said you all, not y'all, because I don't have that. Nice job. Well done. Yep. And <laughs> And then I realized maybe like four or five years after high school, these guys that I was super close to, like it would be weird to hang out with them now. We're not playing basketball anymore. We don't have these things in common. Like I sort of took a road of intentionality with my life. I, I, they were all smoking weed and drinking and chasing girls and just partying all the time. And I, I realized I don't want to be that kind of person. I just, I didn't want to be the kind of guy who uh, you'd have to worry about introducing me to your sister type of a deal. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want them as friends. And I don't know that they would want me as friends. Like life is shifting and I could see it happening. And so I started thinking, well, who do I want as a friend? Who do I will like for the rest of my life? I want their kid to call me uncle. I want mm -hmm. to see them on holidays. Like you got to pick the right people and then be intentional because if you just drift, I had drifted into these friendships that I didn't like. And that was what caused the email and the conversation we had. I had to make yeah. that seem less romantic. No, I like it. I like it. Why do you think that you, because I don't feel like that's a mindset that most people have, especially young people, um, being intentional with the people that you have around you. And I'm going to ask you about that uh, eventually too. But why do you think you knew to think that way? This is something that's probably unique about me that I don't talk about a lot. I tend to see life from a perspective that just isn't the same as the masses. It's very frustrating when you're around me that I don't feel societal pressures. Like I like a lot of people like to go to concerts. Why do you like them? It's just, I feel the energy, like we're all one. Like and that has never been the case with me. I could go to a concert and everyone else is singing and dancing and connected and I don't feel it. I'm just like a person and it's happening around me. I see it, but it doesn't get inside of me. And so when you're at like a Tony Robbins conference and everybody's like swept up in this like mania, I can't get like that. I just doesn't hit. I think about everything objectively and individually. I want to know if I believe this or not. I don't just follow the crowd, but it can be good when a lot of people are going left and, and right is the right move to make. So I I'm also not like uh, swayed by what the crowds are doing. So I wasn't, I didn't fall for financial scams. I didn't do a lot of the things that other people did because they saw everyone else doing it. At that time in my life, it became very clear to me that my faith was like a thing that I had to decide if I was going to invest in it and, and make that part of my identity. Or if my faith was just a thing that I was going to say, I grew up this way, but I don't believe that stuff now. So reading the Bible puts you in a position that you have to like, there's some crazy stuff in there, very countercultural. And you got to make a decision like, do I believe that or do I not believe that? Because if I believe that, that's going to hurt some people's feelings. It's going to offend some people. It's going to make me ask a lot of deeper questions. Like, how could that be the case? Right? Like, if that is wrong and everyone is doing it, like, like maybe like, like having uh, like fornication or having sex with a lot of different people. When I was young, that was everybody was doing that. Well, the Bible talks about that being wrong, right? And the way that it was justified as well, men are biological creatures that have a desire to spread their seed. So it can't be wrong. It's just part of biology. Just go out there and have sex with as many girls as you possibly can. And it's like a race to try to get to however many, you know, girls you can sleep with. But then I would see the girls that I knew in my life that were sleeping with guys were like, self-esteem getting crushed confused all the time maybe they started to jump into that lifestyle and i'm like i don't even recognize you anymore they just became very narcissistic and closed off like they weren't the same caring person i could just see that changed people's like mental makeup and it caused me to have tough conversations with myself like if it's just biological why is that happening 
And why do I feel like it's not okay to be living like that, especially when you're young? And if it is biological, why does the Bible say it's wrong? And so I just, in general, I don't think most people have had those moments where there's a split and they have to make a choice. I think we try to straddle both ends of the fence a lot of the time, and we don't know where we stand on those issues. And now if you're watching the news, it's almost getting impossible to keep doing that. Like the stuff that happens at Target, for instance, very polarizing, right? Uh, Just President Trump that we had for a while. You can't sit on the fence with that. Like there's hardly anybody that's neutral about him. It's either like, I love him, I hate him, or I love this about him and I hate that about him. But like there isn't anything in between, right? I just think for a long time, people could sort of get away with not having that tough discussion with themselves. But when you read the Bible, when you when you're not just listening that someone else said it or the pastor at church told it to you and you don't really quite understand it, it really forces you to have these conversations. And at the time, I was spending a lot of time reading the Bible because I had just broken my ankle. I had surgery. I was on crutches for six months. I couldn't work. All the things that I used to do to keep myself distracted and busy and ambitious, I wasn't able to. And I had all this energy inside. Like, I just want to go be a somebody. I don't like being a nobody. And I couldn't do anything but read the Bible and read faith-based books. And that really is what prompted the conversation with Kyle. Like, is this a person that is going to be a lifelong relationship that we're going to get in lockstep as we go through life? Or is this just another person that's going to go their own way and do their own thing? And I'm going to have to keep looking. Okay. So tell me about your faith, like now versus when you were a kid. Um, what, how would you describe your faith now? Um, whew, how would I describe it? Well, the first thing is you probably have to define faith. I don't think faith is believing in something just like blindly. I think that's a, a misconception of faith. Like for a long time, it was either you have to be a believer or you can believe in science. Like they both don't exist. And so believers were painted like, if you don't agree with this part of science, then that means like you're having blind faith. You're ignoring the facts, right? And a lot of those things have now turned out to not be true. Science thought that was the case. And now we realize that's not the case. And so you weren't actually blindly believing in your faith. Uh, it is very difficult to define what it is. It's easier to find what it's not. But the the gist of it would be, I believe the stuff the Bible says. I believe that it often makes us feel bad about ourselves. This is why people have issues with what's in the Bible, because um, very similar to every time I go to a nutritionist and I get blood work done, they're like, here's all the problems with your health. It never feels good. You're like, Jesus, like no pun intended there that I just said Jesus. (laughs) But like, (laughs) it's I'm like, God, like the older you get, the worse that it is. And they're like, you got to make all these changes. And every single time I eat anything bad, it's like a form of sin. Like I get convicted, like this is not healthy. I shouldn't be eating it, but then I want to eat it. Right. Uh, That is really like when you get into faith, you, it doesn't make you better than other people. It makes you aware of how bad you're really eating of how selfish you're actually living your life, of how so many desires you have are about you and how you win and you benefit and other people don't. How other people's struggles, you're just like, oh, that's sad. But if it happened to your family, you'd be like, I'm going to burn the whole forest down to catch the person that did that, right? You see how selfish you are as a, as a human. And it starts to, like, for me, like faith in Jesus starts to grow a heart that wants to help other people the same way I'd want to be helped. It's why we do these YouTube videos. It's why most of the content that I've made is either free or very cheap. Cause that's what I wanted when someone was there for me. Like my faith gets lived out through it, but I do understand for people that don't believe in it. I get why it's hard because it, it's like, I don't feel good going to the doctor. He's not like, great. Your health is in tip top shape and everything's wonderful. It's like a constant. Here's all the problems that you have. Or maybe you go to relationship counseling. And you realize how unhappy your partner actually is. You're like, I don't want to go back there. I thought I was good. And then I went there and I turned out, but it, what you weren't good the whole time, the Bible can have that same effect. Gotcha. D- now, do you go to church? I do. I go to church uh, Sunday mornings, Saturday mm-hmm. nights, and Wednesday nights sometimes. Do you have like 10 days in a week? I feel like you do so many things. Like, what does your typical week actually look like? Well, I don't have kids and I'm not married. So right off the bat, it's always married people that say, how do you get so much done? Because you don't realize that like 60%, 70% of your life is for these other humans, right? So you've only got 30% of your week to do something for you. I have a hundred percent to do something for me. I also am very good at 
not caring about stuff that doesn't like align with my goals. Right. So if you came to my house, you guys would probably, I would be embarrassed if you guys walked into my house, it's not dirty. There's not like mold and bacteria. It's clean. It's just going to be messy. Right. Like I'm going to take off my t-shirt when I go in, I'm going to lay it on the pool table so that when I'm leaving, I can just grab it off the pool table on the way out the door. I don't want to have to stop and go upstairs and pick out a shirt that matches shorts. And I've spent 25 minutes trying to figure out what I'm going to wear because 25 minutes multiplied over enough time starts to become just inefficient use of time. Right. I have somebody else that comes and cuts the grass at my house, usually when I'm not even there. Um, I, I've lived in this house since 2013, 10 years now. There's not one thing on any wall no decorations, right? So part of what gives me more time to do this stuff is like the the general stuff that other human beings spend time doing because they want their environment to be comfortable or they like their life to work a certain way. It doesn't bother me. I'm not at the house hardly ever. I'm only there to sleep and like eat and kind of hang out. So if I was married, obviously that would have to change. There's another human being that I now have to think about making sure that they're comfortable. But when you just kind of toss aside everything, you're like, I just care about going to the gym, work, the book I'm writing, the thing I'm going to do here, the handful of relationships I have that are really important, the employees that work for me, making the content on bigger pockets. And is there anything and going to church? Like there's a lot more time in the day than you would probably think. Interesting. Interesting. So will you tell me about your family? Um, Like you guys, you said you grew up in a smaller town. Do you have siblings? I have two younger brothers. Uh, We're all 22 months apart. Oh, nice planning there. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, go. Oh, sorry, Cordy. I think we have a bit of a delay. So you're not hearing me until after I've said it. So I thought you were waiting for me to talk, but you just hadn't heard it. Keep going. Oh, yeah, you go ahead. Tell me about your family. I have uh, the two younger brothers. One of them has three kids. The other one has two kids. The one with two kids moved to Idaho. The other one still lives pretty close to where we grew up in a city outside of Modesto, California. He owns a restaurant. Uh, I got into restaurants when I was just out of high school and then he kind of followed me into that career path and he ended up uh, ended up working for another guy that owned one and then buying the restaurant from that guy. So he's a business owner now and he is a bigger pockets fan. He has some rental properties. And then my youngest brother moved to Idaho with his in-laws uh, is not interested in real estate, is not interested in finances. He took over my dad's painting business. My dad was a house painter when I was growing up. And so he got into that and he's just a very simple blue collar uh, doesn't like he actually doesn't like to talk about money. It makes him uncomfortable. He'd rather just make enough money to pay the bills, enjoy his family, keep his life simple. Um, and then my dad passed away in 2010, and my mom remarried since then. So they both live in a city called Manteca, California, with her new uh, husband, and that's the same house that I was in actually, like from junior high on. Okay. Awesome. Um. So. Okay. So when you were in high school, did you want to be a cop? Did you always want to be a cop? It's funny. No, I had zero desire. It's a really crazy story how that happened. When I went to college, I didn't know what I wanted to study. And I am not a person that doesn't like when I don't know where I'm going. I'm actually in a phase of life right now where I'm not sure what direction I want to take business. I want to take branding, if you want to call it that. Like, I don't know exactly what I want to do and I hate it. When I get like, that's the path I want, I it's very, I'm focused, I'm driven, I will blast through an obstacle, but I get very unsettled when it's like, I could do all these things and I'm not sure which one looks right. So I was in that same point right after high school and I just wanted to race ahead of everybody else, but I didn't know which way to run. So I started college, I was a business major, I ended up switching to psychology. I went through a very bad bout of depression when I was in college. I had a really rough relationship with my dad and I didn't know it at that age, but it led to uh, just depression that would come over me at different times. That was rough and like very low self-confidence. And uh, I switched to psychology because school was just getting so draining to me that I had a really terrible bookkeeping class. Actually, I hated the teacher. He was horrible. I couldn't follow. He was like a very old man that was just angry all the time. I couldn't really understand what he was being, what he was teaching us. So I switched to psychology because I'm like, I just want to know what's wrong with me. Why am I like this? And I ended up graduating college with a psychology degree. 
but I still didn't know what career I wanted to get into. And it was really bothering me. I was working a lot of hours as uh, at the restaurant and I was saving money. I probably had near the end of college, like I had, I graduated with over a hundred grand and my car was paid for in cash and my school was paid for. So I was good at that. I just didn't know what career I wanted. And we had these uh, recruiters come in to one of my classes and said, hey, we are hiring for the Department of Health and Human Services for fraud investigators of like state welfare fraud. The uh, I met with them and they said, you have to have a minor in criminal justice to be eligible for the job. So I went to one of the instructors and said, hey, I got one more semester. I want a minor in criminal justice. I only need two more classes to get my psychology degree. Uh, what do I have to do to get a um, minor in criminal justice and she was so nice because she didn't have to do this basically there were like prereqs you had to take in order to take more classes you had to take a total of like 18 units to get a minor in something she said i will waive the requirement that you need to have a prereq to take these courses but you have to take like 18 or 21 units it was like pretty ridiculous I think I had to take 18 units in criminal justice but then I had six units that I had to take for psychology so my last semester of college, I basically had to take, what is that? 24 units, which was like eight classes. <laughs> that was a lot. Like full-time was like 12 to 15, right? So it was like two full-time courses. And it was one of the first times in my life post my basketball career where I was actually had to be very focused to do anything. It was like show up to class, take notes in the back of my head, work on the homework that was due for the next class while I was sitting in the class that I was at. Uh, get halfway done, finish the rest of the homework for the next class while I'm in class and then sneak it underneath the pile so the teacher didn't realize I didn't have it ready when I walked in because I was doing it for that class. Try to read my notes from last week for the test that I was about to go take for the next class. Like, And then as soon as I was done, I still wanted to work. So I would get done with like five or six classes in a day and then drive about an hour to my house to change into my restaurant clothes, drive another hour to the job, work the job, get off at like midnight or so, drive back home, do homework until I passed out to try to keep up and then get up the next day and go to work. But what I learned in that last crazy semester was that you can be efficient if you know what you have to pay attention to. So yeah. many teachers are like, read chapter seven and eight before you come to class tomorrow. And then you do that and you show up and they don't ever even talk about chapter seven and eight. I swear in college that was constantly happening. Like they would give you an assignment and then they would lecture and it had nothing to do with what you read. Like teachers in college love to talk about themselves. They love to get their ego stroke. They love to tell you about their career. And then you have a textbook you read and the two things never jive. So I figured out at that time what's going to be on the test and how does this teacher give tests? Do they get their questions out of the book? Do they get them out of their lecture? Are the tests really just simple and you just have to make the teacher like you? Like all of them had a different angle. And after the first month of that, I figured out for every class what needed to be done, what didn't have to be done. And then in the courses that were easy, I worked on the work for the courses that were hard. I didn't even read any of the work that was assigned to me if it was a thing where they just had wanted us taking notes from the lecture. I didn't listen to the lecture. If it was just read these chapters, I'd literally read the chapters and I was in the class instead of listening to what they were saying. And I think those principles really helped with building the different businesses that I have because you, you learn when you're a real estate agent, when you do loans, when you write whatever the case is. There are certain parts of the transaction I have to do and there's others that can be delegated very easily and there's yeah. others that you just don't even have to do at all. No one will know. They just don't matter. And so I think I learned how to find those patterns when I was in that stage of life. Then I graduated and I didn't want to be a psychologist. I ended up getting my, my minor in criminal justice, but I missed the hiring deadline by one week. We graduated one week too late to apply for that job. And I was so mad. And my mom was talking to my grandma about it because I was just pissed off. And she said, well, I just read in the newspaper that the sheriff's department is hiring do you think, do you think he might want to work there? And I'd kind of made up my mind that I was going to try to get into the FBI at that point. Like my confidence was very low. And I said, what is the job that if I got that job, they would be impossible for me to think that I'm not worth anything. Like if I had that job, I'd never be able to doubt myself again. And I was like, if I was an FBI agent, I don't think I'd ever question my ability. So that was my goal is I'm going to use these degrees to go work at the FBI I had applied when I got out of, uh, I guess I missed the timeline up. I had applied for that job. It was very difficult. I ended up going to a different government agency that I could lateral to the FBI from, and I got all the way to the oral board interview and I failed it. 
and I never failed anything. I was just young, didn't understand how to ask these questions or answer questions at all. Very nervous. I was, I mean, I was grad, I was probably 22 years old, maybe 23. And other than working in restaurants, I'd never tried to get a job. So in that point of just so dejected, I can't like all these feelings of rejection that just made me feel this big. I was drowning in it. My grandma brings up that article about the sheriff's office. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll apply there. And uh, I'll just lateral to the FBI from that point. In my head, I was like, how hard can it be to be like a county deputy? I just thought it was like a simple, easy thing. I didn't realize how intense police academies were. I was very ignorant. But something happened, Courtney, when I made the commitment, I want to be a cop. I To this day, I don't know how to explain it other than it felt like God woke something up in me. I had this feeling like I have to do this. Like it is the only thing in life that matters. I will get rejected over and over and over and over again. And I think Kyle remembers it because I was like, I don't know what it was. I never grew up wanting to be a cop. I just thought of cops like everyone else. Like, I don't know. That's just a cop. I wanted to be an athlete. I wanted to be a basketball coach. I wanted to be a business person. When I made the decision, I think I want to do that. It lit something that was so crazy and I needed it because I ended up applying and getting rejected for 14 different apartments wow. before I got hired. And for me with the confidence issues that I had being told, we don't want you, you're not good enough. We want a better man. It, that was like the worst feeling in the world. And my dad was there to see every time I got rejected and I just felt this big in front of him. And he said a couple of times, like, I don't know why you want to be a cop. You're not tough enough to do that. Like, you're not going to make it through the process. You should just give up on that dream. And it was like, I don't know what made my dad want to tell his kid, like, you're not tough enough to do that. But there was a thing inside me that I knew, like, I have to prove to him and me and everyone, like, this is something I can do. And I look back and I do think that was God's, like, spirit working in my life, putting that fire in there because I needed to overcome my own obstacles. I needed to get over my own fear of rejection. I needed to get over my own lack of confidence. And by putting me up there to get rejected 14 times before I finally got hired, it created like a numbness to rejection that definitely served me well later in life. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, okay. So then you start, you got your job and at, at that point, like, what did you think that your life was going to look like in like five or 10 years? What did I just you thought I was going to be a cop for life. Like I fell in love with law enforcement. I loved the training that we got. I mean, you get to do some cool stuff as like a young man, 25 years old, 26, 27. They're like bringing in expert drivers to teach you how to drive a car super fast around like a course and not crash. You're shooting guns all the time. You're running and then shooting guns. You're climbing up shit and then shooting guns. You're like, being mentally challenged with logic. Like I love law. Law made so much sense to me, kind of like economics. It just clicked. I couldn't understand how people could be confused by it. Trigonometry, pre-calculus. Oh my God. I couldn't understand how anyone understood it. It made no sense to me, but logical things made a ton of sense. And I'm, I'm getting these like lawyers, defense, uh, sorry, district attorneys, legal experts coming in to teach us law. And my brain's like soaking it up. I could see patterns in case law. I could understand how it would be applied. I would remember penal codes and legal descriptions of things. Uh, you're learning how to talk on the radio. Your, your physical fitness is a thing that you're doing like every single day. You're learning arrest and control techniques, which is like a form of a martial art, right? Like it was just an awesome playground for me. And I had not felt like that since basketball in high school. And I had this insane drive to prove to everyone that like I would be good at this. And so I just soaked up everything I could. Like when I got a job, it was like asking every sergeant, what could I do? How does this work? How did you do that? How should I do this? Look at my report. Tell me how I could write that better. The inmate just did this. What am I supposed to do? How, how do you prevent that? I was a nonstop. Like I just want to learn every single thing I could about that career. And then I ended up getting a job at a different police department and got promoted at like everything. I became an instructor for every single thing there was to be an instructor for. I was leading the department in stats. Uh, they would go to me a lot of the time. The supervisors would go to me and ask questions when they got promoted. Like, hey, how does this thing work? They were asking me for help when they were supposed to be my superior. I just loved everything about it and would have stayed in that career for my whole life except for how miserable it got when like a lot of the uh, politics sort of entered into police work. The news started portraying stuff in a super negative light. 
the public started to hate us our own department people don't realize how political police departments are and it's not it doesn't make sense to criticize it because if you're the chief of police you can be fired by the mayor okay so if the constituents of a city don't like cops or they don't like a thing a cop did and the chief of police says i don't care i'm backing my guy he did nothing wrong the mayor can just fire them and replace them with the person who will do what they say it's that easy so if you're the police chief who's like no i'm supporting the cop you don't have a job anymore so they have to bow to the mayor and the mayor has to bow to the constituency because they'll vote a different person in right so there isn't a way to get politics out of police work like it's gonna work that way it was very frustrating that the story the public was being told was never the same story as what we saw they would highlight parts of it they would leave parts out they would add facts that didn't happen to make it look like it was way worse they would never explain why the cop did that or how why that makes sense like shooting someone in the leg this is a very common thing why don't they shoot people in the leg first off shooting people is very hard to do shooting a gun is incredibly hard if you haven't done it like there's a handful of cops that even are good enough that they could just shoot someone in the leg, right? And second off, if you shoot someone in the leg and you hit their femoral artery and they bleed out and someone asked the cop, why, why did you like shoot him in the leg? Well, I didn't want to, I didn't want him to possibly die. But why did you use lethal force? Well, I felt like lethal force was justified because someone else's life was in danger. Okay, then why don't you shoot him in the head or the chest to, to protect the person? Well, because it wasn't that bad and I didn't want people to be mad at me. So I shot him in the leg. So it wasn't that bad, but you shot a guy in the leg who now died. Like you're screwed if that happens, right? That explanation is what we were all told in the academy when we asked the question, why can't I shoot him in the leg? It never gets sold to the public. It never gets explained that you are told you are not allowed to do that. You're going to be sued civilly and the apartment's going to be sued civilly. Like if you shoot someone, it has to be to stop them from either killing someone or causing great bodily injury or harm and shooting them in the leg isn't gonna do that. I would see that stuff, Courtney, constantly. Just this like, I know why the cop did it. Why'd they have to shoot the guy 14 times or 25 times? Well, you have six different officers that are all trained to shoot until they stop. He's got a knife, he's going after you, he's gonna stab you. They don't like, whose turn is it to shoot? They all start shooting until the person stops going after the person with the knife. And at the now you have six people that shot six times and each of them hit the person three times. You went up with 18 shots, but all the news says this is overkill. Why did they have to do it? And it was maddeningly frustrating for me understanding why a lot of the things happened that they did, but it was never explained. And then the public feels like it's just because they hate us. They just don't care if we die. And then you get that hatred coming back at you as a cop. And after enough of that, I realized like this is never going to end. They're going to keep hating us more. It's going to be harder and harder to do the job. The morale is getting lower and lower. Everybody's miserable. The negativity is growing. And that was kind of when I realized like I needed to have a change. Wow. And that was before I feel like things are getting even worse the last couple of years. Yeah. That's why no one's working yeah. in law enforcement anymore. I mean, have you seen like what's going on in San Francisco with they're literally closing CVS stores and whole whole foods? Yeah. Like it, there's so much shoplifting that the workers don't feel safe and they've shut down entire stores because we just like stopped enforcing the law. And I guess 10 years ago, I could see that's where it's going. And I just had the foresight to like get into a new profession where a lot of the guys didn't believe it would get that bad. So when, how many units did you have when you decided to leave uh, that job? How many units? Yeah. Oh, for real estate? Yeah. I never really bought a lot of units. I've mostly been a single family investor. I only have one four plan. How many doors, I guess? Yeah. Same thing though. I had like probably seven properties. Okay. And what what did your mom say when you told her you're going to leave your job and just invest in real estate? Um, well, I had really bad plantar fasciitis. I still have that. Like it got to the point where I really couldn't stand. Like I needed to either be walking or sitting all the time. And so there was like a a physical reason that I couldn't do the job as well. And I had been a real estate agent for a year and I was pretty good at finding clients and selling houses. So um, I think my mom was probably happy that I wasn't a cop because especially the areas where I was a cop, I was working in really rough spots. Like she was not super thrilled with it. And then I was one of the more active cops, you would say. So like there's a lot of police officers wait for them to get a call and they just go to the call. And then there's other ones that are like, Who's doing something bad? 
right? And like I was one of those ones. Like, how do I go find people that are, pro- which means you're more likely to get yourself into dangerous situations. So she was happy. And then it ended up being my first year full time selling homes. I ended up being the top agent in our office. And so that was kind of surprising to both of us. Like, I didn't think I was good at this. And I ended up beating the person who'd been the top agent for like 10 years in a row. And, uh, and that's when I realized like, oh, this isn't going to be as bad as I thought. Okay. So um, let me look at my question for a second. I guess one of the things that I really want to know is that, um, so obviously you do this all the time now. It's not probably, oh, I don't want to say jaded, but it probably just feels different now getting into a new deal than it did at first. When you were getting your first deal, like you're under contract, you're waiting to close. You haven't done this before. You're not sure. You don't, I don't think you had very many real estate role models to look up to. No. How did you feel? Like, were you freaking out at all? Or were you like the very first deal or just the first couple? Um, both. Tell me about the very first one. And then if it changed. I didn't expect I would ever be a real estate investor. I had a right. friend from church who said, I'm moving away to go to Bible college and I'm going to lose my deposit on this house. And I was like, well, so I've been looking at houses because I'm going to need one someday. I just, I was like a casually interested person. Like I liked Monopoly, but I didn't understand you could buy houses and rent them out and make money. I just thought I'll buy a house while now. And then when I get married, I'll just have something to move into. That's how I was thinking. Mm-hmm. And I'll rent it to someone in the meantime. So I uh, went and looked at the house that he had under contract. It had been built in 2006 and we were at the end of 2009. He had under contract at 215 and it was like probably 2,500 square feet and pretty new. It was only three years old. Really nice house in a, in a pretty good neighborhood right next to a school. And I called his agent and said, hey, Matt can't buy your house. But uh, if I buy it, will he get his deposit back? And she said, well, yeah, my broker is the listing agent. It's a REO property, like a foreclosure. And so uh, if you buy it, he'll make sure Matt gets his deposit back. I was like, okay, what do you think we could do on the price? And she goes, let me ask. I was like, well, that's funny. Like, it's just let me ask. Like, I would have thought that that'd be the first thing that she would have brought up with me. So she goes into the listing agent and she says, well, 195 work. I was like, it worked at 215. Like, that's all you got to do is ask. And they knock off $20,000. So I'm, that's how I thought real estate just was going to be, right? This was in the peak of the foreclosure crisis. So if you lived where Kyle and I lived, you would drive down the street and every three to four houses had a for sale sign. It, I, you're, I don't know, Courtney, you're probably not old enough to remember. Maybe you've heard about it. But it was like everything was foreclosed. And all you heard on the news was real estate prices plummeting, red arrows going down, fire stuff everywhere. Everyone told me I was dumb. There, everyone was like, "You, you got to be careful," because they had just seen real estate values crash after 05, 06 when they had been flying high. I don't think there was one person that said it was a good idea. Everybody was telling me it was bad, so I buy it for one ninety five. By the way, it had sold as a new home construction in 06 for five sixty five. It went from five sixty five to one ninety five, and then it dropped to about one eighty five. And this funny you asked that question because I remember laying in bed when I live with my parents and thinking I'm an idiot, I bought it early, that it's still going down. I caught the falling knife. I should have listened to everyone that told me don't buy real estate. What a fool. Why did you think that you would ever be smart enough to be a real estate investor that you saved up? I had to put like $50,000 down or something on the house, right? Like here you are thinking you're a big shot because you saved that you're never going to see that money again. You're such an idiot. The house is going to go all the way down to $50,000. Like that's what we were thinking. Because you're just watching prices keep going down. And uh, maybe a couple months later, it like stabilized and it started going up. This is when Zestimates were kind of new. They weren't super accurate. But I felt a little better when it started going up. And uh, I made the mistake of trying to rent it out myself. I got taken advantage of by a complete butthole that like still to this day owes me seven thousand dollars i'm probably never going to get that money but he lied to me about paying the rent like the entire time he ended up uh getting in a big fight with his baby mama and moving out and she thought he was paying the rent and he's like screw that b i'm not going to pay the rent if we're broken up and so i just ended up having to evict a woman with a new baby it was just like the worst situation to be in but they refused to leave they wouldn't answer the door when I'd go knock. I had to like hire a friend to go serve them with eviction paperwork. And it was just like a slimy feeling. You don't enjoy that part. But at the same time, like they just wouldn't leave the house. There's nothing I could do. 
he had ended up uh the bank had sent my refund from escrow for property taxes to the house and he had cashed that check by forging my signature and paid me rent for the first three months with my own money and then after that he just stopped paying it completely so that wasn't a great experience but i got a property manager to take over uh, they started managing the house and I'm like, Oh, this is awesome. They weren't even good, but a mediocre property manager was so much better than me trying to do it. And I learned about leverage. I learned about hiring other people to do stuff for you. And I eventually didn't hate that. I bought the property and I bought another one the next year. So then when you bought the other one, were you nervous? One of the reasons why I ask is, um, I was just talking with a friend the other day and she's looking at getting a big old farmhouse and it's got some, a lot of problems to it and she's under contract and she was just so excited and then all of a sudden she gets so nervous and she I, I she said she cried and she just like am I putting my family in a bad situation and I said I think that especially in the beginning almost everybody gets there they are doing it they're so excited and then they panic a little bit and then it kind of they use that panic and if it goes away then they know they're in the clear and if not then maybe it's a sign uh, that they shouldn't go for it. But so d did you have that at the beginning? Did it eventually wear off? Does anything give you that feeling now? Everything gave me that feeling when I bought it. The price went down. I got ripped off by my tenant. It was like I would have just sold it and never owned real estate again if it hadn't went down to the 180 or 185. That's the funny thing is it was like God was protecting me by making the house go down in value because when the tenant didn't pay rent, I had to go through the eviction. I had to go through several months of making the mortgage without any money coming in. Um, then I found out also that there were higher property taxes in that neighborhood than in the rest of town. I didn't know that was a thing. My agent didn't tell me that. And she's selling her own like broker's listing. So I felt like they all colluded against me to rip me off, right? It was supposed to be a $1,200 payment and it ended up being like, 1350 because it's an extra $150 a month of property taxes, which in, in 2010 money is probably more like three or $400 in today's money. Right. Yeah. And I just was like, the whole thing sucks. Everybody sucks. This whole thing's a ripoff. I had such a bad experience with it. I wouldn't have done it at all. And then there came a point where the property manager was taking care of all the crap I didn't want to have to take care of. And I got a rent bump and it went from like, like 1500 to 1600, which was felt pretty significant. And I was like, all right, so, you know, my mortgage was 1350. It was running for 1500. Now at 1600, I'm like $250 a month to do nothing. That's like a whole overtime shift. If I buy 30 houses, that's like working a day of overtime every day. That was how it, I thought in my head, like that's when it clicked. And then my mom called me and said, Hey, there's a house down the street for me. She of course wanted me to go move into that house and like live next to her. But I was like, Oh no, I could just buy another rental and I could do this again. And that's why I bought the second house. But to your question, everybody gets that feeling of like real estate sucks and so many things go wrong with real estate that you cannot control I, everyone listening to this now and in the future has had moments where they thought i'm an idiot why am i doing this it's almost always when something goes wrong that house that i bought the second one a drunk driver ran into the fence and knocked it over and i remember thinking i'm an idiot for buying a house on the corner should I should have known better. You don't buy houses on corners. That's everybody who's going to be like making that turn. They're they're going to run into that fence too. Like why do those where do the voices come from? Why would I think I'm an idiot for buying a house on the corner? But that's the way that I was thinking. To this day, I just bought a lot of real estate. The neighbors hate short-term rental operators have made my life hell. For 10 months now, I've had multi-million dollar properties sitting vacant with high interest rate loans. We're talking six figures of income being lost every single month because the city won't issue permits every time someone goes out there the neighbors are literally calling the police they're like what can we do to make this person hate this so bad that they'll sell the house after i've already dumped a bunch of money into the construction it's miserable it's easy to be like yeah i never should be investing in real estate this is a terrible idea but could i have predicted how the neighbors were going to behave now going into it, I can understand that's the thing. I should probably go talk to the neighbors before I buy a property, see what their thoughts are. I just didn't know that at the time. It doesn't make sense to beat myself up for it. And it will always happen, Courtney. The good news is when you look back at what a house is worth 30 years after you bought it, I've never heard a human being that regretted that they bought real estate. That's like the mantra right now. That's your mantra, I think. You've heard me say that before? Oh, I, I, it gives me peace every time I say it. 
but man, I didn't realize that that was short-term rental permits. I thought it was like uh, building permits. That it's, were holding well, it's also construction permits. So because the neighbors have caused such a big stink about it, the city's trying to get me to give up so that the person, the, it's actually three or four different properties where this is happening, where the neighbors will just stop calling about it. So they'll go in there and they're like, okay, you pulled permits for plumbing. You pulled permits for whatever up. Oh, you didn't pull permits to get the kitchen cabinets replaced. So they're like, you need to get permits for that. So we'll submit a thing and they'll wait as long as they can. They'll wait three or four months and they won't get back to us until I have one of my employees just blow them up every day. Okay. Yeah. We'll schedule someone to go out. That person goes out 30 days later. Okay. Yeah. We see that the kitchen cabinets are put in correctly, but uh, I noticed that the stairs are a little too far apart or too narrow. We're going to need you to replace the stairs too. And we're like, are you kidding me? That's how it was when we bought it. Yep. You're going to have to do that. Like they're just effing with you because they don't want the house to be completed because then they have to issue the short term rental permit. And then the neighbors are going to be like, they're some of them are literally calling police when the contractors go to the house. Like there's someone breaking into the house that these people are doing stuff they're not supposed to be doing. And so the police show up and the contractor is like, I got my tool belt on. Here's my bit. Like I'm a contractor. I'm not a crackhead. So uh, it is very frustrating. Like I, I'm, I'm not, so wealthy that i don't understand the struggles that people are having that came at the same time that interest rates all went up so income from real estate sales disappeared it's very hard to get people that can buy affordable houses and there's so much competition for homes it's incredibly difficult to put buyers in contract this is like a very very hard market for agents interest rates went up refinances disappeared people stopped buying houses the one brokerage income no one's getting loans, right? Like it's it's starting to turn around right now, but the last five months have been, everyone wants to sit back and say, I don't want to buy real estate or they want to buy real estate, but they're getting outbid by everybody else. So that happened at the same time that a lot of other things went wrong. And I get it. Like it, it can be incredibly stressful trying to operate in our space. How do you like handle that stress now? <laughs> I cry to Kyle about it most of the time. <laughs> <clears throat> let's uh, uh let's pause right there really quick just do a quick reset um first of all courtney you are doing a great job let us know in the comments how you think courtney is doing with her interview skills she's looking like a professional down here i'm loving it um also do us a favor if you're liking this share this with other people um uh, make sure you hit the like button hit the subscribe button we're trying to get it up to thirteen thousand people but man this is really good stuff we're getting some peek behind the scenes that we don't normally get in, in David's life. Larissa says you're doing a 10 out of 10, Courtney, in terms of your skills. So love it. I think you might have another side profession here, uh, side hustle that you could uh, move into. But um, okay, let's go back to your question. So you're asking David, how do you handle with the stress of dealing with all of your businesses, your challenges, especially right now in the current state that they're in, as well as the economy? I don't know that I am handling it. Like it's just a weight that's going to sit on me and people offer advice all the time. It's it's they're trying their best, right? Like, well, why don't you try this? And why don't you try that? If, if the advice people offered is something I could do, I would have already done it. Right. I, you're just stuck. You're not going to get out from underneath this thing. I don't think there is anything I'm doing to handle the stress. I think you find a way to accept this weight is going to be sitting on my chest, right? Like I've had to wrestle with thoughts that I haven't had to wrestle with for years. Like I, another thing, as some of the people in this community know if they're in Spartan League, they've heard me talk about it, which you guys should consider joining Spartan League and just getting insight into this stuff. I had a person who stole title to 25 of my rental properties a couple years ago. He heard me talk about it on the podcast. He found a glitch in the state of Florida's website that allows people to edit legal entities that are registered in the state of Florida. So he found an LLC of mine. He added, you can't subtract, you can't like erase people's information, but it would allow you to edit and add your information to someone else's C Corp or S Corp or LLC. So he added himself as a manager to an LLC that owned 25 properties. He paid a notary, probably a friend of his, to say that I signed over the title to his LLC. He then started selling those properties, claiming he was a wholesaler to people at real estate meetups in North Florida. So I started getting these messages on Facebook Messenger saying, uh, that, do you own this property? Because it looks like you did a couple months ago, but this guy's trying to sell me three properties for 80 grand. 
Like, I don't know who that is. What are you talking about? Yeah, and this other investor over here said the same thing. And now I'm getting messages from different people all the time. And, and title companies are like, hey, we have this house in escrow. We're trying to sell it. There's a cloud on the title. It looks like you uh, you sold this property to him, but it wasn't registered correctly. And I'm like, I never sold that property to that guy. Like, I don't know who that guy is. So oh, you didn't know him? No, he was a complete scam artist. He just knew who I was from the podcast and figured out how to steal properties because of this system that he put together. So uh, it was a year and a half, or sorry, it was about a year of not controlling my properties. He went to the land, the property manager and showed him the deeds and said, you need to pay me the rent, not David. I own these now. When the property manager wouldn't do it, he went to the tenants and said, I need you to pay me the rent, not the property manager. He showed up at their house with like his homeboys with guns to scare everybody. Mm -hmm. The tenants moved out of the houses because they were afraid. And then uh, homeless people moved into the houses. My air conditioning unit started getting stolen. Right? It was, it was 25 houses where I lost control of all of them. Like probably seven or eight of them, like a third of that whole portfolio turned into people stealing the stuff and squatters moving in that I couldn't get out and the house is falling into disrepair and the property manager's like, dude, he started, he wouldn't pay me the money. He's like, I don't know who owns them. I, I like you, David, but I can't get involved in this. He's got a deed saying they're his, the cops would show up and he'd show them the deed. And they're like, it's a civil matter. There's nothing we could do about it. He just messed up my life. I had two employees that were both getting trained to manage my portfolio for me that quit because of the stress of trying to figure out what to do yeah. with that whole situation. It was horrible for them, right? A year later, uh, I he finally goes to jail. It took the, the sheriff's office a long time to investigate that crime because they had no experience right. with white collar crime, like title theft. None of us really understand how that works. Uh, and then about three months after that, a judge gave me back title to the property. So it was about a year and three months, not a year and a half. Well, I, I talked to the state of Florida and they said, we don't have any plans to change our system. So that can't happen again. It's on the docket to be voted on in the middle of 2023. This was like beginning of 2022. I was like, well, this dude's friends could go do this again. Can we put a red flag on these, like a hold so that you don't let the title transfer through the county recorder's office? Nope, that's not our policy. They just didn't care. So I basically had to sell the whole portfolio to a hedge fund in one go before anyone else could steal it, which threw me into a 1031 that I didn't really want to be in right when interest rates were starting to go up. And I was like, I want to sit back and wait to see if prices go down because rates are going up. Well, I couldn't. So I had to buy a whole bunch more property, which is that's how I ended up in the situation now where I have neighbors complaining, unable to get the permits going because during a 1031, I, you know, you have 45 days to identify, but I didn't find the properties that I bought until like a week or two weeks before the deadline. So there wasn't time to do the due diligence that I would normally want to do. So that stressed me out. The guy stealing my properties created pain. Um, the issues with not being able to put renters in them. Like I ran my numbers correctly. I bought in great areas. I bought at great prices. I mean, when you looked at how much I paid for the real estate versus what they appraised for, I bought a million dollars of equity over 12 oh. houses. It was incredible, right? Like I, what I knew, I did really well. I negotiated, identified the right properties. I had the right vision. What I didn't know was how much the neighbors can make your life hell. When I had been last buying a lot of real estate, that wasn't an issue. I hadn't bought that much real estate at one time uh, for a while. So I have stress from that. I had stress from the 1031 that I didn't want. Now I have to learn different markets. I have to get new property managers. I have all these properties that I bought that now have to be rehabbed and prepared and furnished and learning how the short-term rental market kind of works, meeting the property managers, getting all the stuff ordered for them. Then you have all your normal issues like employees people having issues that come up in their lives. It's very hard. I have two companies that have one of them has about 30 people. The other one probably has 40 or 50 people and they all have complex personalities and egos and desires and like complications. Right. So then the business world took a really big hit. This wasn't too long after Brandon Turner had left the podcast and I'm trying to figure out like, how do I make enough content that people don't say where's Brandon and just leave bigger pockets altogether. There's a lot of stress about that. I'm trying to write the book Pillars that's going to be coming out in October. And writing a book is just a hard thing to do. Most people don't write books, so that they don't understand how hard it is. But And that was the hardest book that I had ever written. I mean, I, there's probably more stuff I'm missing with just <laughs> how stressful it got. I bought a property in Blue Ridge, Georgia, and it froze and a pipe burst. 
and the whole house flooded, but nobody went in the house because we were renovating the garage for a week. So it sat mm -hmm. in like a foot and a half of water for a week. The entire floor rotted, the subfloor rotted, the water went into the basement beneath it and caused a bunch of mold to grow in the basement underneath that house. Like it, there was a point where every day I came in and it was problem after problem after problem. Oh, when I sold that portfolio in the 1031, the escrow company missed a lien that I had on some of the homes. So I sold them for about $4 million, a little under 4 million, and I owed 550,000. So I had to reinvest about three and a half million. But there was another lien for another $550,000 that they didn't find. So I sell, I reinvest more money than I needed to. I spent 550,000 that I didn't have to buying property quicker than what I wanted to. Then they came back to me and said, hey, you owe us this money. You owed it last week. There's a penalty on it now. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just sold those houses. They're like, oh, well, we didn't get paid. So now I owe the bank $650,000 because they put a $100,000 penalty because it was late, right? What are you going to do? Like the escrow company messed up. There's no title insurance for sellers. That's for buyers. Um, ultimately, they're going to say it's my responsibility. I don't, I mean, I put that blanket mortgage on those homes like years ago, man. I didn't remember. And I happened to have two loans that were both 550,000. So when the number 550 popped up, I was like, yeah, that sounds right. It didn't pop in my head. It was just thing after thing, after thing, after thing that wouldn't stop and kind of hasn't stopped in a lot of ways. So your original question is what do you do to handle the stress? Right? I think you just get, you accept the fact the stress is not going to go away. You learn to operate in the stress. Like I still have times where I'll wake up at night. What am I going to do? Like, how did this happen to me? Where did I make a mistake? It seems like the mistakes I made were tiny, but been amplified into these huge issues. Uh, when you have all the other people that are involved in all the different businesses and, and the people that quit that were managing the portfolio that I had to try to jump in and figure out what I do and all the people that are working for me that now are trying to get second jobs because it's too hard to sell houses. This market is super tough. I don't know that there is a way to manage the stress. I mean, I work out more than what I was doing before, but to be honest with you, Courtney, I think it's an acceptance that I'm not in control of a lot of these things. A lot of us listen to content like this because we want to take control of our lives. We want to take control of our finances. Well, I don't like where I am. I want to do this thing to get better. And I, I encourage people to think that way. But ultimately, you do have to understand you're not in control. You know, I don't mean to be morbid, but your child could get sick and you can't stop it. A drunk driver can run into a loved one and you can't prevent that. You can't control who's going to be elected president or what they're going to do in the company. We don't control uh, what Russia is going to do. If you live in Ukraine right now, my problems don't really sound like significant problems to them, right? right? They didn't plan on Russia just walking. They do, We don't have control in this world. And that's an uncomfortable thing to think about, but I've just sort of had to come to grips with. If these things that I did not foresee happening, which were triggered by things that weren't fair to me, someone selling my property, escrow companies missing these uh, titles, the, the entire real estate industry just becoming incredibly difficult from all the inflation the government has created, if they lead to me failing in a sense, right? I have to choose if I see myself as a failure or if I get humbled and brought down and rebuild again in a different way. I guess that'd be the only thing that I could say when you're thinking about stress. I haven't had to worry about failure. Like I just live so conservatively. I save so much money. I put everything in reserves. I don't buy anything but real estate and I mean, I like refill these bottles of water. I'm just not a person that spends a ton of money, right? Real estate and shaving cream for my head. That's about it. Um, I have to wrestle with like, if it, if it does go wrong, can I just be okay with the fact that it went wrong and rebuild it again with what I've known, which I don't think is much different than you, Courtney and Kyle and the people that are here listening to this. We all have to face those same concerns. What if I lose money on the deal? What if something goes wrong with the rehab? all you can guarantee is that something will like it, there will always be a thing that goes wrong. That doesn't mean you did real estate wrong. That's good. Good perspective on it. And you interview so many different people that uh, have fallen and come back up. Um, it's pretty, sorry. It's pretty inspiring. Thank you for that. I'm sure that I just probably took a lot of the wind out of your sales because that was like a 20 no, dialogue. 
So I want to look at my questions because I know we're going to eventually run out of time. But um, so I do. So is that one of the reasons why you I know that you took a little break from jujitsu. I wanted to ask you about jujitsu and um, and why you love it and how you got started. But um, I like is that a reason why you were took a break on it? I, I stopped the first time when I went into the 1031 because it was so stressful. Like every night I was talking to different agents from across the country because you have to pick a certain amount of real estate that you're going to identify and it's very stressful to get it right. So that was a couple months of identifying the properties, trying to close on them. After a couple months, I traveled, then I came back and now it's been like four months and you're like, man, there's so much to do. Everything's going wrong. I, the last thing I want to do, I just want to try to get this work done, which turned into 10 months of just not going back. Like I, I even started lifting weights again, but I didn't go back to jujitsu. And um, it's one of those things where there's a saying Hal Elrod says that stuck with me where he said, it's easy to do. It's not hard to go to jujitsu, right? It's at like seven o'clock, 730 every night. I just drive there. It's in between uh, my office and my house. It's not that bad but it's easier not to go, right? It's easy to go to the gym, but it's easier not to go. It's right. easy to meal prep, but it's easier not to meal prep. And so I have to think about the shadow side of me, the dark side that wants to give you an excuse to not do the thing that you said you were going to do, even though that thing is easy. A lot of things in life are easier, right? It's just easier to not do it. David, can I ask on the jujitsu thing really quick? <clears throat> can you share a little bit about your experience with jujitsu, both the good things about it and the bad things about it, and how you take what you're learning from that and apply it to your life? Yeah, and it's a complicated thing because human beings are so different, right? Like, Courtney, if I said, hey, I want to get you up on stage, you're going to speak to 2,000 people, and you need to crush it because this is the opening speech of a huge conference, would you be like, hell yeah, put me in there? Um, I'd be terrified at first and I would try to get used to it because David Green's asking me to. Well, that's really sweet of you, right? <laughs> but like most people, if you ask them to go speak in public, would be terrified and would want nothing to do with that. Okay. And you're a good speaker. You showed up to this YouTube thing willing to do it. And you still said you'd be terrified. Most people wouldn't even agree to go on camera and interview me. If I said, um, you're going to have to be one of the thought leaders in the entire space. And if you give people good advice, they will build big wealth. But if you give them bad advice, they will lose everything. Most human beings are like, no, thank you. I do not want that pressure. I do not want that responsibility where one careless word could cause a lot of pain to people, right? In those areas, I feel pretty confident holding that mantle, right? Just when you go to an event, it's like I could make or break someone's whole time being there, whether the interaction I had with them was confident and uh, fruitful and I made them feel good or it could ruin the whole event if they felt like I blew them off. Like that's a lot of pressure in that world. But then there's other people that do things that to me are very difficult, right? It's every human being is so different. When I first started going to the gym and lifting weights, I was so insecure I mean, I don't know if you guys were here like last Friday when Kyle showed pictures of how skinny I used to be. That's after I had been lifting weights for two or three years. If you had seen what I looked like before, it was embarrassing. Like I wore three t-shirts everywhere I went to try to look bigger than I was because I looked like a skeleton. The thought of going in the gym and lifting weights was miserable. It was like, I just had no confidence. I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. I had these demons in my head that were just telling me over and over and over, like, you're pathetic. Look at that guy. You're never going to look like him. That guy would snap you like a twig. None of those girls would ever give you a second thought. And that's not even to mention the fact you're balding. Like that stuff was in my mind nonstop. So when a guy would be like, hey, do you want to go lift weights? I wanted to say yes. But I felt like, no, I don't. I, that's the last thing I wanted. I would only go in the middle of the night when no one was there. But I don't even know how to lift them. I don't want to get hurt. I need someone to show me. And I was just stuck in this thing of not wanting to go feel like I wasn't good enough. Uh, but then there's other things that I could do that other people would have never been able to, right? It's like, we're different. Jiu-jitsu is a very challenging thing in the sense that I love it, but I hate how I feel when I'm there, okay? Everyone's better than me. They're younger than me. They're smaller than me, which this sounds weird, but in something like that, being smaller is, is better when you're new because they don't get tired as fast. It's easier for them to move around. It's like all about movements and leverage. Being big and strong doesn't really help you a ton until you get good. If you're really good, it can benefit you, but not when you're starting off, right? Like imagine trying to learn how to ride like rollerblades. 
or some maybe skateboarding. You don't see a ton of huge big guys that are good at skateboarding. It's usually like smaller guys like Rob Deerdeck that can have the dexterity to kind of do that. Um, they've all been going longer than me, and they have nothing else in their life other than that. That's the other thing is you're going in there with killers. He's like, by normal human standards, they're kind of losers, right? They put up fence boards for a landscaping company. They cut grass. They they work at Walmart, right? You're talking about like a 27 year old guy that works at Walmart. In jujitsu, is the only time in his life he gets to feel like he's cool. Like it's their everything. They're addicted. That's all they want to do is just go there all the time, right? And then I'm showing up like two or three times a week on a good week with a million other things in my head trying to squeeze this in between all the other stuff. And I don't need that to feel. Really, I feel bad when I go. <laughs> like I, I feel good when I'm doing this type of stuff. So there's this uphill struggle, Kyle, if that's what you were getting at, that it's that same feeling of not being good enough that I have to wrestle with every single time I go, which makes it very easy to not go because you don't want to feel that those feelings, but very important that I do go because you got to wrestle with that part of you. There's a, there's a dragon in all of us that says you're not good enough for this. I think, you know, I'm not married, but I'm sure in relationships, there are times where your spouse exposes your insecurities. They expose what you're worried about, right? And you have to be able to wrestle with that. Otherwise, you'll just leave the relationship or you'll just break apart the family. Jiu-Jitsu sort of cause I have that struggle with that thing specifically, right? I don't have that struggle if I go lift weights. I don't have that struggle if I hike. I don't have that struggle if I run. I don't have that struggle if I play basketball. It's specifically that that's very difficult. But like Kyle said, when I'm going, I recognize patterns and improvement that apply to other parts of life. And I, it helps me a lot relating to the people that are not as successful as me. So when you talk about real estate nonstop, it starts to just, it's like a guy that's done jujitsu since he was five. Like they don't even think they just, they could close their eyes and just feel it all. And it would, they would be really good. I've been around this so long and so often that to talk about real estate or to see angles and deals or to understand patterns is like, I I'm doing my eyes closed and I forget that new people, it's not like that. But when I go to jujitsu and I'm like, man, just like doing the somersaults or just rolling around on the ground or just taking someone down or getting taken down, standing up, getting taken down, standing up. That's tiring. I've had to stand up 12 times in a row and I'm 240 pounds. That's a lot to make me stand up. Right. I, I forget how tiring that is for, for the people that are listening. When I talk about analyzing a deal, that's exhausting for them. They're like, there's so many things they're trying to figure out. So when I do go, it makes it so that I relate with the rest of the world much better. I think that's what, that's what Kyle was noticing about it, right? Like I am much more patient. I am much more understanding. I relate. I have more empathy because I've been in the situation where I got my ass kicked over and over and over. And I recognize they feel like they're getting their ass kicked. Oh yeah. I know what that's like when you're just on top of the world and everything you touch to gold and you're crushing it, everything you do, it becomes very hard to relate to the people that are not doing that. That's very interesting. I need to look it up more and, and see what it's about. I literally only know about it from you hearing about you, you doing it. What do you picture in your head when you hear the word? I don't know, like Taekwondo or something in that sense. Is it? It's no, it's more, it's like wearing the clothes they wear in Taekwondo, but wrestling okay. more. Okay. So it's like all about, you're not punching and kicking. You're just like wrestling with someone and trying to isolate a joint and make it bend in a way it's not meant to bend until they just say, okay, I give up. Like you're not actually breaking each other's arms, but you're doing something that would break their arm, break their leg, break their foot, choke them out, that type of a thing which is what makes it so fun to do because we're not actually punching each other to where we're causing traumatic brain injury. Like if you get me, I just say, okay, I tap or I tap and you're like, all right, done. And then we can go again and no one really gets hurt. Okay. I'm definitely going to look at that. Um, my next thing I want to ask you is, um, so I want to know what you like to learn about other than just real estate, like what fascinates you. Ooh. I know one of those things is the intersexual dynamics. So if you want to talk about that here, um, I'd love to hear more about your side of it and what, how long you've been looking into it or if there's anything else you want to talk about, I want to hear about it. Yeah, if you guys haven't been following any of that stuff, I don't know. Maybe some people don't care. I find it to be fascinating. I, I like Priscilla and I had the conversation. It seemed like she found it fascinating. I basically grew up with two brothers and a dad and me, one mom who did not understand how to communicate with boys. And there was constant friction in our family. Kyle actually had the same family dynamics, three boys, dad, and a mom, right? So our moms were always upset, pissed off, 
freaking out, stressed out. And I'd hear people say things like, well, she had to raise three boys. But I was like, yeah, what's the big deal with that? Like, boys are not that hard. Girls are crazy. Like, we're really simple, right? But meanwhile, we're like playing catch in the house and breaking things where we wrestled every chance we could get. It was always me versus my two younger brothers. One of them always got hurt. You don't realize the stress that you're creating on your mom when you're like, let me see how high I can climb and jump off of this thing. Like that's what, what boys are doing. Right. And so I didn't have a great relationship with my mom, but I didn't know why it's like, there's pain and I couldn't understand it. When I learned more about intersexual dynamics, how women think, how they experience the world, what they mean when they're saying things and how different that is than men. I understood my mom way better. I realized how to avoid causing her pain. I realized how she interpreted my actions and how I should interpret her actions and it changed a lot. The same was true with like trying to date women. I could not understand why they were, why they felt the way they did. And so I just typically would like write it off like, well, they're just crazy, right? Or they just need to get that figured out or they're just immature. And I, and it would constantly be a problem. Like, I mean, I could give you examples if you want, but when I started learning about what a woman's experience is like, what things mean to her, what her heart wants and how she's interpreting what I do. And I realized, oh, that is not even anything close to what I would have wanted her to feel. Many times when women felt controlled, it was a man trying to protect them. And I would see these like speakers that are talking about this and they're like explaining to women when he said no, you thought he just doesn't care if you're happy. He wanted to stop you from spending your retirement budget, putting a pool in a backyard when you don't, when you can't afford a pool. And she's like, wait, that's why he said no. He, di he didn't want us, he didn't want me to work another four years of my life because we bought that $90,000 pool. I thought he just didn't care about my needs, right? Like when I started seeing how much pain comes out of marriage and relationships because the two sides don't understand how the other one was wired, I then realized I'm not the only person perspective in the world. I know that sounds weird to say, but many of you haven't had that moment hit you yet where you haven't realized that the way you see it isn't the only way to see it, that there is a whole world out there that is seeing something completely different that is just as valid and, and it can teach you how to win with the other side, right? Now I know how to win with my mom much better. I don't carry this guilt around all the time that I'm just hurting her and I can't help it. Uh, and, and like with the, the, the women that work in the companies, with uh, the friends that I come across, right? Like I communicate, I think, way better. Kyle would probably second that because he's known me for a very long time after studying how women think and then hearing that they don't understand how I think has changed the game for me too. I just assume the way I think everyone knows. And so if they're not, what we do is we ascribe our motives to what the other person did. And they usually had very different motives for the decision that they took. And so I listen to a lot of podcasts. You mentioned Alison Armstrong. She's one of my favorite people that teaches this. I listen to her all the time. I'll listen to the podcast where they'll just bring men in and women and they'll just talk. And you'll see how wildly different their viewpoints are. Right. What's and it, lots of different ones. Um, I'm trying, what's a good one, Kyle, that we could share? Because some of them are sensational. They're like almost like Jerry Springerized, mm -hmm. where you take it with a grain of salt. But the, the content can still make a lot of sense. I don't want to promote one of those ones and have people get offended. Kyle, help me out with one of this. What's a what's a safe one? That's a hard one because they're all like right on the edge, right? Well, we can skip it if you think it's a bad No, idea. I know there's there's definitely good stuff to listen to. Um, I mean, the whatever podcast can be ridiculous, but they'll bring in like typically like young women and they'll sit down there and they'll say like, how do you see life? And then the women will explain how they see life. And the male hosts will usually be like, do you realize this is what guys are seeing? And, and it, it just shocks me, I guess, Courtney, that they aren't seeing what we see. That's the most crazy thing. When they share their perspective, I'm like, that is so different than how I would have looked at that same action. So different than how I would have looked at the world. Um, I'm really trying hard to think if there's any names that are popping out right now of like, Maybe maybe we can move on and I'll think about it over time. Do you guys in the comments, do you have anyone you like to listen to that gets into the same type of stuff? What's uh, Allie's name? She's pretty good. The real femme sapien. What's her name, Kyle? Allie yeah. something? Allie, yeah. I think I have her on social media. I can't remember off the top of my head. Allie's... There's a couple. No, not Stucky. No, something. But is it? No, yeah. 
there's a there's a few of them out there, but yeah, I'm curious if other people listen to that kind of content too. Red Pill Rants. Ali Drummond, that's her name. Drummond. Yeah. Is it mainly like behavior based or is it any of it um like are there research studies or is it just like studies like case studies and a and ton of research has been done from something like online dating because online dating's okay. been around for long enough now that they'll do research and they'll say like what have we learned about male and female natures by how they behave with who they swipe on how many dates they go on how relationships end up working out like i find that stuff to be fascinating yeah i want right? to hear like, about that like what for instance did you if i had to guess if i had a if you had a guess right now who initiates divorce more men or women what would you guess women okay and how much what percentage do you think it is that initiate divorce more 70 Wow. So what makes you think that women are 70% more likely to initiate divorce? Um, that was my instinctual guess, but um, I think that I've talked to people before that have told me how set men are once they get into a relationship. Yeah. And um, I think I read something somewhere that said that a like, a man losing his wife or his woman is like a mother losing their child. And so it seems like they would um, be less likely to leave that comfort zone. That's so awesome. You're very good. It's 80%. So you're very close to 70. And if the woman has a a degree, it goes up to 90%. It's very, very common. Like men are not really leaving relationships right now. And then you ask why? Well, because men tend to look at relationships, like you said, like you don't love her because of what she does for you. You don't love her because of what she provides. Just like you don't love your kid because they provide for you. You love them because of who they are, which many men then assume that's how women are looking at them. Like this is where it becomes fascinating to me because I'm like, well, I just love you for you. So we could get in a fight. We could get in an argument. Maybe if you don't talk to your kid for a week, let's say your kid's 19, they move out of the house. Do you stop loving them? Are you like, I'm going to get a new kid? Cause you didn't call me for a week but he because he's little no. right but you would there would never be a time that you would think my kid didn't talk to me i'm just owning them right right no. as a man if we aren't paying enough attention to that relationship it doesn't occur to us you might quit the job you might leave and find another guy because we wouldn't do that if it was that bad we would just tell you like this is what i need we speak more directly right well, that's not what most women are feeling a lot of the time. Like somebody in the comments said the man has emotionally checked out, right? That's probably a reason why a lot of women do end up divorcing. But do women understand what makes a man check out? That, okay. Those questions don't get asked very often. Like what they don't even think guys have feelings, much less that we would protect them by emotionally shutting down, right? When you go ask a man, hey, what's going on in your marriage? And he's like, well, you know, I've initiated intimacy this many times and she rejects me every time. She has a headache. She's tired. The kid's distracting her. Like, I just gave up. Like, I'm. they don't realize that that hurts him. Like, it hurts him deeply to be uh, rejected at his core that many times. Like, our sexual nature is a deep part of who we are. When you are accepted in that way, you are accepted for who you are at the deepest level, which means when you're rejected, it can feel just as painful, right? So to protect himself, he shuts down. He stops trying. He sees his wife and he wants her, but he doesn't want to get rejected again. So he goes into the other room because it's just too painful to try again. Right. And then he goes out in the garage and he starts tinkering with the stuff because he's trying to keep himself busy. And slowly his heart just starts to get cold. And instead of speaking to her kindly and warmly like she wants, he becomes robotic. That's how we protect ourselves as men. Right. And then they perceive that and they don't like to think that maybe they did something that hurt him. So it's men are just like that. They're just jerks. They just don't care. All he cares about is himself like that. Now, of course, I'm giving an example of a hypothetical one. I'm sure the same thing happens when the roles are reversed. Yeah. But it's, what's fascinating is that we don't ask questions like why? Why is he emotionally checked out? Why does he not listen to me enough? Why does he always try to fix my problem instead of just understand what I'm feeling? I mean, Courtney, you're a human being. I imagine that comes up in your marriage. You know why I know? Because every single married person I've ever talked to says that happens right like since the world's been spinning women have been going to men for empathy and to understand how they feel and men have been trying to fix their problem but no one says why you know what i've learned about that the reason women expect empathy in many cases is because you guys are naturally empathetic 
it, it like it's like cheap you have so much of it you see someone like dude if i just talk and i share emotion i watch a woman's face melt like oh my god he's hurting and then she starts to hurt that does not happen with dudes like i see kyle start to get like breaking down and i'm like oh my god like it's it's probably similar to if i was watching him bleeding out like that's the emotion that we experience like you're gonna die right like this is terrifying it doesn't make me empathize with him if he was bleeding out he wouldn't want me to be like david i want you to know how much this bullet wound hurts can you share in my pain he'd be like fix it plug this <laughs> hole right like i'm gonna die i want you to make a tourniquet and that brings out that instinct with us that's that's how we naturally would respond to each other and then we respond to women because empathy is expensive for us it's exhausting i say it's like leg day for guys I don't like working out my legs. I like my upper body, right? Not everyone, but the majority of women, they would rather do leg day. <laughs> they don't want to do push-ups and bench press and pull-ups, right? Because those muscles are just not as strong on our body. Well, like women naturally connect with emotions and empathy. Men tend to naturally connect with logic and reason. So when you guys come to us looking for empathy and we don't know we're, su we're supposed to use our legs, we try to solve it with our arms, which just hurts you even worse. And, and if we're being frank, the reason we try to fix the problem is because we're like, this is so exhausting to have to show empathy. I just want to fix it so I don't have to do that anymore. Kyle, can you can you second me here? Am I right about this? Yeah, no, this is all, I mean, really good stuff because I 100% agree. It reminds me of that, uh, that YouTube video. You guys should go check it out. It's called um, It's Not About the Nail because <laughs> it explains exactly what you're talking about. Have you seen that, Courtney? No. Kyle, can you pull that up while we're talking here? Yeah, that's this actually a great idea. Good. I'll pull it up and play it for everyone gonna like here. It. So like we as men, if we don't understand the way women are wired, which we don't because women don't explain it to us in the way that our brains understand with logic and reason. Okay. Like this is we it, like I, I see Rosalie's comment that men fail to see that for women. It's more emotional than physical. As a man, I don't know what that means. Right to her, like Courtney, you probably read that and you know exactly what Rosalie is trying to communicate when she says it's more emotional than physical, right? Yeah, I can't see it, but oh, that that comment, right? Well, as a dude who hears that, I'm like, I see the words, I'm reading them, it nothing sinks in. Like, I need you to paint me a picture for what it means when you say it needs to be more emotional than physical. And I would go my whole life not understanding what I'm supposed to do when they say something like that. Until you start listening to some of these podcasts, reading some of the books, listening to the, the communication experts that are like, this is what she's feeling. You're like, oh, that's that's all that I had to do. Right. It just doesn't come natural to us. And so it, in essence, I think why I find it fascinating is that there's so much pain that we're all going through that we don't have to be if we understood this stuff better. Do you think that like there is a point that it can be learned? Maybe yeah. not all the way, but like 100 percent. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because Alison Armstrong was talking about a man's testosterone levels around 50 years old. They tend to drop precipitously, whereas a woman's drop enough that her testosterone levels, I don't know their testosterone levels rise, but I think the ratio changes because her estrogen mm -hmm. levels drop a little bit. And what happens is you get women that hit their 50s and they become like, I want to go start projects. I want to go take a new job. I want to reclaim furniture. I want to buy real estate. I want to analyze deals. They get super into like my business side is coming out at the same time that men are like, I just want to sit and hold you. And I just want to watch the sunset with some sweet tea. And I want to hold your hand and just take things slow. And like she says, it's this point where if you do it right, you sort of cross at just the right time where it becomes easier for men. But when we're like 20, 25, we look at that stuff like that's the enemy. Like that's going to make me weak. It's going to stop me from accomplishing anything unless someone sits us down. Like what Priscilla just said, right? I know for me, if I'm upset with my boyfriend, if he just hugs me for 20 seconds, it goes away, right? That you're not in your head. Like to you, that's obvious. That's the, that's the solution to the problem that you're looking to solve. You're just looking at the wrong problem. Yeah, but we I, if if I was mad at you, okay, this is what I'm saying we do is we take how we feel and we project it on the other person. Mm -hmm. If uh, if I'm mad at the girl because she screwed up, she gave my bank account information to someone and they ripped me off. She left the front door open and someone walked in and stole the stuff. She backed into my car with her and, and, and I don't know, whatever it is she did, if she comes to hug me, it feels like I'm being manipulated. Yeah. Right. I'm like, that's sneaky. What I want is for you to say, I was wrong. I am sorry. This is how you know I will never do it again. 
I don't want to hug you. I don't want to be mushy. I don't want to me, me, me. None of that until it's like you are you realize the mistake you made and how much it cost me and you're not going to make it. Then when you say you're sorry, my like resistance goes away and then the hug can happen. But what tends the women probably is like, I feel bad. He's mad at me. I want to be hugged. Right. If we don't understand, that's what both sides are going through. Courtney, I would never go hug you or never go hug the girl because to me, that would be like wrong. Like morally, that's wrong. I need, I don't deserve that. I need to make it up to you before I could hug you. Or when you're having a bad day, I don't think that hugging you is going to help. Right. I have no idea. And, and that doesn't get communicated. So, like, this is a perfect example that people in the chat, are saying, yes, obviously that's what we need. And the other side's like, what? I had no idea that was going to be the case. My husband's over here texting me. Oh my gosh, he gets it. <laughs> and every woman here, when Priscilla said, I just want to be hugged for 20 seconds said, oh my God, she gets it, which is the same thing you thought, Courtney, right? Like, I don't want to be hugged if I'm mad at you. <laughs> if I'm mad at uh, I'm, someone else, I'm your boss, say somebody work with, but, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. my mom or something, uh, then, and she's also listening. So, uh, if I'm mad at somebody else, then yeah, maybe a hug would help, but not if I'm mad at you. See, as the man, we're like, man, I just don't know. Like, I'm not going in there to risk it. Cause if we go to hug you and you're like, get off of me, that's rejection. Our ego gets battered. We feel hurt. We withdraw, we leave you alone. And then you're like, not only does bad thing happen, but now he's withdrawn and he's not here for me. He only cares about himself. Like you see how that can spiral into like bigger problems. And then if you let those thoughts linger for too long, you start to question if you should stay married or you start to question if you should stay in that relationship. And then someone's sliding in your DMS. There's a lot of that. The studies are showing that Instagram is the number one dating website in the world. Really? The amount of yes, the amount of like attention that women are getting from men now is more than it has ever been. And so you have in general, women have this idea of like, why do I need to put up with him not hugging me? There's 75 other guys that would hug me. And that's going on in their head. And then you have guys that are like, Yeah, why do I need to put up with her rejecting me? There's 75 other girls that I could go pursue, or 75,000 other girls that I could go pursue. One of them probably wants me to hug her. And you see how those thoughts can like grow and grow and grow into creating immense resentment and eventually destroying relationships. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. So, what do they say about like the dating apps? Uh, well, the, one of them was like the divorce rate stuff. They have okay. shown that. Uh, as much as this is people, I don't want people to get mad at me. I'm just be mad at the study. The more sexual partners somebody has when they get married, particularly with women, the lower their marital satisfaction scores are. So they do a lot of like research on why that might be. And a lot of it has to do with like, um, when, if she has like, if she, let's say she dates a guy who's just hilarious. He's so funny. She has a blast every time she sees him and another guy who's like super wealthy and he takes her to really exotic locations all the time. And another guy that's like incredibly handsome and ripped. He's like a professional athlete, right? Oh. What happens for a lot of those people is then they get married to a guy who they love, but he's just kind of average and they compare his body to the professional athlete, his sense of humor to the guy that was hilarious, his money to the guy that was super rich. And they feel like I got ripped off. Like I could have done better, even though that isn't what they actually think, right? So this message that people are getting repeatedly that says you need to go out there and play the field, you need to go through your party years, you need to go like be with as many different guys as you can. The studies are showing that that leads to them having a harder time staying married and less marital satisfaction when they're married. And then once you're divorced, I think if you're, I think what's the divorce rate like forty or fifty percent or so? I think it was around. Once you've been divorced the first time, you have a 65% chance of getting divorced the second time and an upwards of 75 the third time, right? So like once you go as a pattern of like, I'm getting divorced, um, it becomes harder and harder and harder to stay married. That's another thing that like the, the dating apps would show. An another, this is another piece of interesting information because it's swiping a constantly, you're just looking at pictures and figuring out like yes or no on the person. Um, women find over 50% of men unattractive, right? It's like a small percentage of men they find attractive. And then for them to be willing to go out with him, they're basically going after the same 10 to 20% of men on all the dating apps, okay? So 80% of dudes are getting completely ignored. The top 10 to 20% of guys are getting all the attention. 
because all the girls want to marry like the best guy they can get on this app, right? Well, if you're in the top 10 to 20% of dudes, how motivated are you to settle down with one girl and just get married? You're getting your DMs blown up by girls that are just like throwing themselves at you all the time. Those guys become players. And so you have all these women that are chasing the same guys who then don't want to settle down because they have all of those options. The women are getting frustrated and heartbroken. Those 20% of men are crushing it. And the other 80% of men are getting completely discouraged and left aside and rejected. And women don't understand that's what it's like for the average guy because they tend to get more attention. And so they assume it's like that for us too. Like if you look at a girl's Instagram account and how many DMs she gets, I promise you like even as a person with a lot of followers, I don't get any people in my DMs hitting on me. It does not happen. Like most women just ask yourself how many guys, strangers you've messaged on Instagram to hit on them. Doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. But like women, even if they're not posting anything wrong, they'll still have dudes throwing their shot. It just happens constantly, right? So women think that's how it's going to be for men too. And the, the dating apps have shown that that the, uh, it's like a really big problem. Did you know that 33% of men are either virgins or haven't had sex in a year. Wow. And that's no, not uh, the people that want to be, right? That's like they're trying right. to, right? Most women are shocked when they hear that because it's not hard for women to find a sexual partner. It's like stupid easy for the most part, right? Guys are just like throwing themselves at women in general. And so I didn't know any of that until the dating apps that are accumulating this information, seeing who's swiped on, how often they're swiped on, how many, how much attention people are getting, how often they go on dates. Like we didn't have any of this information until recently. That's wild. Kyle, you have the video? I do. Yeah, I have the video. This is good if you guys haven't seen this. It's satire, by the way, but check it out. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And... I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. But you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things. <laughs> so it's not about the nail. Did anyone else laugh at that? Okay, thank God. People are in the comments saying that they do find that to be funny too. Courtney, what do you think when you see that? Um, oh, Is it offensive? Did it like bother you? No. Okay. No, because I do think that that's how a lot of people are. I hope that people grow out of that stage. Um, but I, I do see it. So you can relate to like the, the insanity of... I'm trying to help you because you're not saying anything. Do you want me to drop it and let you move on or do you want me to let you work through it? No, I'm just, uh, what do I think when I see that? I don't know. I just, um, my husband would probably have a different thought than I do, but uh, it just being so obvious there, but I, it's funny how he eventually just let it go and then everything seemed to be happier <laughs> for at least a little while. Yeah, I think that it highlights really well just that men want to fix things and women want to be understood, right? Yeah. And uh, those those um, dynamics, I don't look at it like, yeah, I'm right and they're wrong. So they just need to be like me and just let me fix it, right? It To me, it reveals a deeper thing about human nature that if a man can understand, he'll be much better with women. It's She doesn't want to have him just empathize and understand the pain in her head she wants him to understand her soul 
her and she wants to feel seen in her nature like what she's experiencing her feelings again i can't speak for every woman but the women that i've talked to have sort of co-signed this Th their emotional state or their feelings m make up their identity like that's if you ask her like who are you it would be a semblance of what they're feeling right whereas in general a man's identity is kind of based on his opinions we like to talk about our opinion if you like who's the better president what's the better gun uh, what is a ford better or a chevy our opinions reveal our value system so we look at it like if you want to know who i am you need to understand my opinion on things and every man's like yeah obviously and then we think you guys are the same way but you, most in general women don't really care about their opinions nearly enough unless they grew up in an environment where no one cared how they felt or thought as a um as a defense mechanism they will often become very opinionated because it shelters someone not caring about their feelings which many of us grew up in homes where that was the case and so if dudes can understand that the reason she doesn't want you to fix the problem is be, is is not just that she's stubborn it's that she feels like you aren't connected that there's yeah. no intimacy right and she needs that to feel love for you to stay bonded to you to want to make you happy now it makes sense as a man like yeah don't even ask about how she's feeling with the nail dive deeper than that like how's she feeling about being a mom how's she feeling about the job she's doing as your wife how's she feeling about the role she's playing in society and like listen to that type of stuff like i'm watching your face change even as i'm saying that courtney right i'm not a dumb guy but i live my whole life and never understood that concept until i started listening to some of this content it is interesting yeah i think i guess the nail is just like so obviously it's supposed to be obvious to be funny but i was thinking what is my nail and it's mm. definitely like having too much on my plate and then my husband just being like you need to scale back you need to scale back and then it's like my my response to that is very much like hers would be do you know why he wants you to scale back like do you know what his motive is um peace okay <laughs> and he knows i go too hard i uh, can i pause i don't want to speak for him but can i tell you what i think it probably would be yeah go for it he wants to connect with you and he can't because your cup is so full of these things that have nothing to do with him and the family and you're doing it for the family in your mind you're doing all these things because they need to be done and he's sort of like like you're in the middle of the forest surrounded by foliage you're like i gotta chop it all down it's there's too much of it i have to get it together and he feels like he's sitting up above it like actually there's a path right to the side where it's like clear walking if you would just stop doing that and i could get you over here you wouldn't waste any of this energy and we would be fine and we don't know how to communicate that to you guys and you guys don't know how to communicate what you're feeling so what probably happens is like you come home with a million things in your brain he wants to connect with you and there's like nowhere to connect it's like he wants to hug you but your arms are full of all the stuff that's the best way to put it right and so you need like a law like hour two three hours of talking to get all of that stuff organized and where it's supposed to go so that your arms are open and he's like yeah in three hours i'm gonna be asleep like yeah. we're, we're gonna we're not gonna connect right and so uh, that's that's one thing that I've learned with in general when men are like, I don't want my wife to work. It's interpreted sometimes like you want to hold me back. You think I can't do it. You think you're smarter than me. You want me to be dependent on you so that I have to do everything you say. And that's usually not what's at the heart of it. It's that they see the version of you when your arms are open and you can hold the baby and you can hold him. And it's like much more soft. It's much more feminine. It's like, uh, and in general, I've, I've found that like when women are in feminine energy, they're happier. When you're like giggly and silly and swooning, it's never when you're in a masculine, it's like gotta get things done, right? Like, in fact, a woman probably has to have the feeling of like things are gonna be okay before she can even get into that state. But that's when he feels closest to you. So I don't, you'd probably ask him about it, but I think for the women that are listening to this, many times they're interpreting a guy's motives and they don't understand that what he really wants is to connect with you, but he can't if you have all that other stuff on your mind. He just wants you to be like into him and, and connecting with him and letting him uh, bury that, carry that burden. Kyle, anything additional you think I missed there? No, I think, I, I think that's really what it comes down to is connection. And I honestly think that the majority of arguments and fights between couples tend to be one side either coming out of fear and usually it being a fear of lack of connection with the other one. They feel like they're losing that connection. It's sort of gradients of getting closer and closer. And if you feel like you're being pushed farther and farther and farther away, 
you want to cling to it more, which is why you tend to argue or, or get stressed more. And I think the farther you get away, when you start getting really separated and you feel far from each other, you just, you don't even notice it anymore. Right. And so you lack on that intimacy. I really like what Jeremy said, cause this is like a big thing, right? Especially once you have kids, kid focused household, you forget about yourselves often. And that is absolutely 100% true in any relationship. Cause we look for distractions left and right. Even this last week at my house, my wife's been really, really sick. So I've been having to like take care of the household and um, we've been less connected as a result. And I'm like, oh, I miss my wife. I got to get closer. Got to figure out how to bridge that gap again. So definitely uh, good stuff. What are your thoughts, Courtney? I want to know what the guy with the 10 kids and the 23 year marriage has to say about this. <laughs> Chantel oh. said, uh, well, why doesn't he just say that? Which I'm guessing she, when she says that, I think she means, why doesn't he just say that what he really wants is to connect, right? The answer is because men are incredibly comfortable with like open com compliments and intimacy, which I know drives women nuts. Yeah. Cause it's like, the, that's what they want, right? Like if I'm going to like compliment Kyle, I can't just be like, you look handsome today, right? I have to be like, dude, you don't look as ugly as you normally do. Did you get a haircut? <laughs> like, it's like looking directly into the sun for us to like compliment each other. And I've, and I've seen a parallel with women cannot take direct criticism. Like women would never look at another woman and be like, you look hideous. And except in like a movie or something like in general, it's veiled. It's subtle. It's implied, but they don't directly criticize another woman. Right. We can't really like openly compliment you or say i really want to connect with you right i can't even picture like i'm just laughing trying to say it right now on the you show like it's that. very yeah. hard for guy. and i'm not saying it's good but that's the answer chantelle is to like when your husband's like yeah uh, he gets frustrated he's like why don't you just like stop working so much or why is that so important to you or all you care about is whatever what he's trying to say is our relationship isn't as it's taking a back burner to all the other things you want to do and i want to be your hero I want to take care of all that stuff. I want to have my arms full of everything so that you can relax, but we are not taught or shown. Like I'm just saying, we don't know how to talk to women. That's exactly why we're talking about this right now. Like it benefits us so much to have you guys in the chat saying, this is what we need. I would venture to say a lot of men don't know how to be men nowadays. What do you mean by that? That's good. I mean, a lot of men don't, don't know how, I mean, how many guys are living in their parents' basement, right? And then they end up getting married and they just want to play video games all day, right? Oh, or they're yeah. afraid to take risks. They're afraid to be a leader. They're afraid to yeah. um, be the hero that they need to be, right? So a lot of times women, as a result, end up losing respect for those men. And then what happens when the woman loses confidence in the man's ability to be strong and provide and be masculine? She wants to take over control. That's it. And then she gets into masculine energy because she's like, well, I have to do it because he's not doing it. And then when she's in masculine energy, she's not happy. She's not giggly. She's not romantic. She's not swooning. She's not falling into his arms. And he's like, well, why are we in this relationship then? And that's the cycle that so many people in our current culture have fallen into. The men are weak. And so they don't go do men stuff. And, and they, to their defense, they don't know they're supposed to. They've been sold this message that like masculinity is toxic and they're supposed to not be too bold. And if they hold a door open for a girl, they're going to be judged for it. Like literally, you guys not believe me. I will be at the gym watching a girl like tiny, 95 pounds, trying to pick up the 45 pound weight to carry it to the squat rack. And I'll just like grab it off the thing for her and just move it from here to here, right? Because she needs like two feet hands and she has to get her legs into it. And I can just grab it with like a finger and they'll give me the most dirty, hideous look. I can do it myself. I don't need your help, right? So men get their heads bit off and we're like, okay, go like go get your step stool to reach up and try to get the high thing and then and pull the weight down. I could just do it for you and I'd be happy to. It's like takes no energy of mine. And so men back off. And then women step into that place and then women get told that's what a real woman is. She could do everything a man can do and she can look good doing it, right? So now they're like, why don't you praise me and recognize me for my masculine energy? And the guys are like are threatened by that. Like, what? <laughs> you don't need me if you already have your own masculine energy. I need to find a girl that wants my masculine energy. And you see how like that just creates these problems. And then the, the intimacy goes away because you need to have her in that feminine state in order for her to be like open to that. Thanks, Jalp, for saying it's an awesome conversation. I'm glad you guys like it. 
I like Chantel said, OMG, yes, please open the door for me because I'm tired. <laughs> like there needs to be like a like a sticker we can put on someone's forehead to know like, are you the person I can open the door for or not? Are you the person I can help like carry that thing to your car? Like when I was younger, I used to be like walking through the parking lot of like Target or Walmart or whatever. And like I'd see some woman with like a big, huge bag of dog food. Do they still sell those big, huge bags of dog food? I haven't seen them. Oh, yeah. The pre arenas yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, like the huge oh, yeah. thing, right? Mm -hmm. And she's got like two of them in her cart and she's trying to put it into like a big pickup. And I just like smile, say, hey, and I just grab it and put it in the pickup truck and then be on my way. Like I don't know that I would do that now, right? You're going to get like, you get looks. Uh, yeah. Or or ostracized or like yeah. made fun of. Um, where are we going to go ahead, Courtney? So just keep doing it. I feel like once, once that's gone from the world, any chivalry, it'll be a dark place. That's part of, that's why I like that content because it exposes that women do want that. Or if they don't want that, what might have happened in their life that would make them closed off to it, which now puts you in the position that maybe you can provide what someone else didn't in a healthy way. Right. I'd be curious too, how much of this is regional, right? Like in a place like the Midwest, right? In a small rural country town, is, is it more normal for, you know, is it, is it less looked down upon for a man to be masculine and a woman to be feminine? Or is it, is it sort of that, that ideology even bleeding out out there? Oh, um, I think that there's definitely more, um, especially, especially like older men that will definitely hold the door every time. Um, but I do see like strong women at my gym as well. Uh, but the women at my gym, like they can show that they can carry the weights. But if somebody was going to help them, they would be kind about it. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be the dirty looks. I don't know. It's it's a different world out there in California, I think. That's what they say. That is true. I mean, California is a great example of this. Like we live in our own world and we don't know that other people don't think like us because I've been here my whole life. So in my head, this is how the whole country is. Yeah, and and go ahead, Courtney. No, we we look at we we definitely look at California as a whole nother world over here. You're trying. You're saying it nicer than it probably gets spoken about. It's just wild out there. Is it, things happen first there, and then they trickle over this way. That's true. That's very true. You guys are still saying things like "get jiggy with it." I have never heard anybody say that. <laughs> <laughs> Just like we uh, in Manteca, we still say hecka. Yeah. That's hecka cool. You guys say hella over there, Courtney? Yeah. But that started in California. Like I used to, when I was a kid, if I said hecka or hella and I was not in California, they didn't know what it meant before the internet. Interesting. All but right. listen, yeah, I, I just wanted to share one last kind of thought on all of this is the reason why David and, and myself and even Courtney, the reason that we were talking about this is not to divide, but it's actually to bring people closer, right? And like David said, like he doesn't want to see anybody get divorced. And it's sad when people are DMing him saying, help me divide my assets. And so we sort of have it on our heart to like try to figure this out because we see it affecting so many people. It feels like an epidemic. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we're definitely on a search to try to find it out. Even while we were in Maui, David and I spent our evenings watching a TV show called Couples Therapy. And we would like, it's on Showtime. We like pause it and break it down. Okay, this person's saying this, this is what they're meaning. But you can see when this guy says this, and it's this, you know, these people, these couples showing the relationship dynamics. And we just, we really have like a, a fun desire and uh, uh, I guess a passion for figuring out human dynamics. And at the end of the day, it makes us better investors. It makes us better wealth builders. It makes us better real estate agents. It makes us better just people in general. So that is uh, the thing that pushes us to do all of this. What's the appetite in the chat for if you'd want us to do a retreat? Kyle and I have talked about either a couple's retreat or just a retreat on this topic where we get a bunch of people together and women get taught how men think and why and men get taught how women think and why. And we would actually get the opposite genders sharing the information that we're missing. Like it can be really powerful. I'm sure when like your wife tells you something over and over and over and you just, it doesn't sink in. Right. But then if Courtney were to say the time of the same thing or another woman, you're like, oh, that's what she's trying to say. Like, have you guys ever noticed that when your parents told you something, you're like, whatever. But then when someone else said the very same thing, you're like, that's brilliant. That's so wise. I think that there could be a lot of uh, benefit 
to having men have it explained to other women what their woman might be going through. And maybe like just that, maybe she just needs a 20 second hug in the middle of the argument. It doesn't occur to me to give a hug when we're arguing. I have to win the argument. Otherwise you're going to do the thing again and we're going to have the same pain. We're going to go through the same problem and then it becomes inefficient and men want everything to be efficient, right? But it actually is the most efficient thing to hug you if that's what you're really looking for. Make sense? Makes sense to me. All right, Courtney, what do you think? Any other questions or any, and we just got, well, I, I, have about, into that. I have about 150 more questions for you, <laughs> but I'll just ask one um, for now. So um, I'm going to be at BPCon in the fall and I wanted to know what advice would you give to first timers trying to get the most out of the experience? BPCon. Oh, that's really good. <sighs> Don't come try to talk to me when I'm just walking around because I, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm probably being swarmed by everyone and I don't want anyone's feelings to get hurt if it seems like I just kept on walking or I talked briefly when I went. If you want a picture, have your phone out and just be like, can I get a picture? The answer will usually be yes. But if it's like, let's have a 15 minute conversation, then I want to ask for a picture because I don't want to be rude to just ask. Bad call. Um plan on being there's going to be more events than you can go to so they'll have breakout sessions where you're going to go and you're going to listen to different speakers right so uh the speaker you listen to will have a big impact on the actual experience you have if you go to listen to a person you've already heard everything they have to say or it's on a topic you're not interested in you're going to think bp sucked bp con sucked if you go listen to a person that you've never heard that's really really good that talks about maybe tax strategies you've never heard of or like some asset class that's new you might think it's brilliant so it makes a big difference who you're paying attention to and then if you can bring a friend like it's just more fun to make those memories when there's someone with you and you're not walking around by yourself feeling awkward trying to attend an event yeah priscilla mentioned i see she says rcf in the chat kyle do you want to explain what she means by that I actually am drawing a blank, so you got to help me out with that. So RCF, she's mentioning when you see David, don't be shocked that he walks around with resting cop. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. It's very true. I have my own version of RBF, and it's called RCF. I'm not mad. I'm not mean. It's just how my face looks. And he's taller than you think. How tall are you? What would you guess? What would you think? I'm not a good person at this. I don't know. Six two. That's really, that's exactly how tall I am. Now it doesn't seem like I'm that tall. You should have shot lower. <laughs> made me look better. That's Kyle says that because that's the number one thing that everybody says when they meet me. They're always like, whoa, you're taller than I thought. And that's the joke. Gotcha. gotcha. So Ray, very close. Do you think that there's any value, like, or I'm sure there is value, but how much more value is staying at the ho hotel that the conference is actually held at versus getting an Airbnb somewhere else. I don't think there's more value staying at the hotel. Like, unless you're a go to bed early type of person, because what you're probably going to do is the event ends, you're going to go rub elbows with all the other people. You're going to sit in the lobby and talk. Like you're going to meet people that you know, or, or bump into someone and you're just going to have long discussions about it. Uh, if you're the person who like stays up late and then just needs to crash, stay at the hotel so you don't have to drive to your place. Yeah. But in general, you're just going to stay until there's nothing left going on. And then you're going to drive and go to sleep and then wake up in the morning and come back. So okay. I don't think it's a big, big value to stay at the hotel. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. I'm glad that you're going to go. Yeah. Looks like we had a pretty good reception on doing a retreat about male, female dynamics. Yeah. Nice job there, Courtney. So how do you feel interviewing David Green? Um, I'm thankful you brought me on for sure. That's I like you said, I could ask. I could probably ask you questions for days. What do you guys think? Should we have Courtney back again to ask more questions? There are other 137 since she only got to ask like a handful of them there. Let's see what they say in the comments. Kyle, what are you thinking? Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I think Courtney, you did an amazing job. Uh, thank you so much for coming in and honestly being brave and risky in a sense to come in and ask these questions. Courtney came up with all these questions on her own. So these were not like uh, questions that were fed to her in any way. Um, so I thought you did an amazing job and yeah, mm -hmm. there was still a ton of questions, um, that we didn't get to get a chance to. So I'd love to do an encore in, uh, the future. I think that'd be really, really cool. But, uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on. I, uh, it's really nice to be here and, and meet you guys. Yeah, it was a blast. Thank you. All right. If you're watching this video, please subscribe to the channel, share it and like the video. Uh, if you would like more, 
content from Kyle and I, check out SpartanLeague.com. This is the mastermind that I run that is a full personal finance group. We teach you how to make more money. We teach you how to save more money. And then we teach you how to invest in real estate. So check out SpartanLeague.com if you want to be a part of a community of badass people that are all on the same goal. And then lastly, we are going to be doing a retreat in Fort Lauderdale. Kyle, you want to let everyone know about that? Yeah, absolutely. Fort Lauderdale, July 26th through the 30th. 30th, uh, Space is limited and spots are filling up. Our guy, Jason Wallahan, who's been commenting tonight, he's going to be there. We're looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be really, really cool. We're going to be talking about the 10 ways you can build wealth through real estate. We're going to be talking about um, your portfolio. Actually, David's going to be able to take a peek at your portfolio, what you can do to improve it, what next steps you should be taking, whether or not you're just getting started or you're down the road uh, in your career. This is going to be a really good opportunity, not only to um, to come and learn and figure out what your next steps are, but also to rub elbows with other people, not to mention to sort of get into David's inner circle, right? And, and have access to his team, uh, the coaching that we provide, uh, and let alone just a really, really good time. So go to davidgreen24.com slash retreats. You can sign up now. Um, and there's a lot of really good information. So we're looking forward to this next retreat. That's right. And, uh, bring a friend with you, right? If you know someone else that you think might be interested in this kind of stuff, uh, the goal is not just to give you information you haven't got from someone else. Like information isn't going to make a difference for most people, right? The goal is to dive deep and to figure out what is stopping you from moving forward, what specific ideas to your situation that you could go implement and to create a passion in you that's going to help you want to go do the things that you haven't been doing. Uh, the last one that we were at, a couple of people cried. We had people saying, I don't know what it is. I don't know how to describe this, but I just want to be around you guys all the time. Like there's some energy between Kyle Christian and I that it's very authentic. We, we are transparent. You're not being sold something. I'm going to be there. Kyle's going to be there the whole time. It's not like I just show up and do a little presentation. People are always surprised because we're becoming friends. Like that's how you're building yep. relationships. And uh, like Priscilla, you see here. Uh, Priscilla is like a lifelong friend. Now we got to know each other very, very good. She cares about my future. I care about the success she's going to have. She mentioned her boyfriend's name several times. I've met him. Uh, if you're looking to take things to another level and you don't want to just be orbiting around success, you actually want to get into success. This would be a really good first step to take. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Courtney, thank you again for hanging out with us tonight. Uh, this was a blast. If you guys like this kind of content and you want to see more of it, drop a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are about tonight's format, about some of the topics we talked about, because at the, the most, we want to be able to bring you guys really, really good content uh, on a regular basis. So with that, I hope everybody has a great rest of their weekend, and we will see you all next Friday. See ya.